Sholem Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. Before we get further into this, I need to correct a few rhetorical errors I made in the previous videos. Dr. Weisfeld does not endorse Bernie Sanders. What he had proposed was critical support in the context of an education campaign. Dr. Weisfeld does not endorse Bernie Sanders. Let me repeat that. Dr. Abram Weisfeld does not endorse Bernie Sanders. And if I can fit room into it uh, with the special editing skills of Donna Newman, I'll elaborate further into what we think caused all this massive confusion. Aside from the fact that Dr. Weisfeld, Donna Newman, and myself have been under extreme heat in every way. Remember, Dr. Weisfeld is in the West Bank, and he was detained and tortured. Donna Newman has had serious death threats made on her, and she's been attacked in the street a couple times. Fortunately, I'm good at biting ankles if I can get low enough, and uh, Hannah Toff is pretty handy with a baseball bat. And it's uh, good when we're around in that sense. Although, the problem with trying to bite people's ankles is, is they can take a boot on your head and it hurts, and that happened to me that yeah, it's anyway. I don't want to get off track. The pressure that the three of us have been in um, on trying to get things correct, and we do need a correct line, as we are anti-Zionists, and sometimes we've misunderstood each other and said the wrong things, but there is not a division here. <laughs> Just as there's not a division going on between Hanatoff and Miriam Emmesberg, there is no division between myself, Dr. Weisfeld, and Donna Newman. There has been need for more discussion. And I would like to personally thank Donna Newman for finally clearing up publicly what has been going on in the background for all these years, as I have been privy to it, by the way, but I, I don't speak of things like that among comrades and colleagues. However, to freely move around freely in a political sphere, I do not, I cannot be, you know, held back, and, you know, she has recognized that. We would not be anywhere without Donna Newman. We would not be anywhere without Dr. Weisfeld. Dr. Weisfeld provided a lot of important theory, and anybody who knows me knows I can't stand Brad Kuhn and mutualism, and that I have worked really hard to ban it, you know, and, and, and try to outshot everybody in that area, and I've been mostly heard. But, you know, some people would be like, well, then why do you like Dr. Weisfeld's Federation book? It mentions, you know, Prad Kuhn was like, exactly. I love it when you can take any revolutionary that is Marxist or anarchist, take what they say, put it in a context that they didn't intend in a much better way, or in a context that they did mean it, but in one that had not been possible, and one that leaps beyond what dogmas you might be from. For instance, nobody could adhere to a dogmatic mutualism among the Bundists, but if we took certain things from Proud Kuhn and used it correctly, what we understand as correctly, and prove it, well, that's awesome. That is why... That is why Dr. Arpen Weisfeld is very essential in the concept of permanent revolution, and why this inspired Donna Newman's current work she's working on on permanent revolution. She's writing commentary on the permanent revolution um, by uh, Leon Trotsky. What inspired her was observing Dr. Weisfeld's context of permanent revolution. Dr. Weisfeld took the context of Leon Trotsky's permanent revolution and applied it to where Leon Trotsky would not have necessarily applied it. And that's very important because it does show that Trotsky, people have accused Trotsky of Eurocentricity not everybody agrees with that, and on this one I speak just for myself. Others have things to say, but I will only speak for myself. Better to do that than to give other people involved. I only speak for myself when I say I do consider Leon Trotsky to have been the most Eurocentric out of all the Bolshevik revolutionaries. That being said, however, I will also say that he's probably the one with the highest intellect. And it was wrong of Lenin to discard Trotsky when he 
spoke about the international proletariat. We know that Lenin believed in the international proletariat, but we also know that the, the socialism in one country does not come from Stalin, it comes straight from Vladimir Lenin. We do not, we are not against socialism in one country, and we are not against permanent revolution. In fact, you could say that we're for both. But we will take these theories and put them in a more correct context, regardless of what any Marxist feels about it. We could care less about what a Marxist feels like, out of like, oh, you're being revisionist. We are not revisionists. The truth is Karl Marx, and we've all stated this several times, because it's true, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were historical revisionists. Period. End of story. They were stuck in the Hegelian dialect. Some of us like to use a little bit of Hegel, but those of us that do only like, I said before, a fourth, I'd say more like a seventh, if anything. I don't use any, I don't use any Hegel. I detest Hegel. I'm going to tell you why I detest Hegel, for two reasons. And this first one I share completely with Dr. M. Weisfeld. I completely disagree with the nonsense of the nation-state. And then secondly, as a mystic, what people do not understand is I don't necessarily disagree with scientists on a lot of things. No, I don't agree with the scientific method, necessarily. I prefer deductive reasoning through a logic basis of pattern research, but there is a real consensus on mysticism that you'll find with Sufism, Zen, and Kabbalah, and all that stuff, and there's a consensus just like there is with science. That consensus was largely undermined by guess who? George William Frederick Hegel. And do you know why? Because he shoved metaphysics into mysticism. Mysticism, yes, it gets into the supernatural, but it also is grounded just as much in the material as science. All that went out the window thanks to Hegel. I detest Hegel. I mean, let me, let's make something clear. You bring a creation scientist in front of me, I'm going to ridicule them. I don't believe that we should abandon reciprocity, but if you're dealing with a creation scientist, why should... I, I denounce, in fact, Bill Nye for even debating a creation scientist. That's, 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 that's not credible. And another thing from the mystical point of view, I denounce B'nai Baruch and all the people that they're, that they're taking into that occult, the Kabbalah Center. That's not genuine Kabbalah. Genuine Kabbalah is Jewish. It is... It, 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 you can't even get into Kabbalah unless you get into the Torah and the Talmud. Now, I'm not here to get you into an esoteric conversation, but it's important we understand where this all intertwines. We are rational thinkers here. We don't have time for the fictions of the nation-state, and we appreciate the critique that the anarchists have made on the state, and we appreciate the analysis that the Marxists have made on the state, but we find them both to be an error. We know what the state is. Now, this is going to be similar to what the Marxists say, but what is the state? The state is a repressive tool. That's what the state is. It is when people are property of the country. It's a repressive tool. So this is a similar This is similar to what, what the Marxists say, but and we can get into that further at another time, but so we have a similar definition to the state as the Marxists, but we find them to be an error as well. You can have a country without a state. Countries have sovereignties, so a country naturally would have probably a standing army of some sort because of sovereignty, and sovereignties can range from anything to a, a monarch, queen, whatever. Of course, if it's a monarch, then it's a state, um, and a king doesn't have to be a monarch. Uh, but but regardless, you know if. It, the sovereignty could be anything from a royal system or royal family to a constitutional basis. That, that, that sovereignty constitutes a country, which is what separates it from territory. But the state is a repressive country that uses um, the measure, it has built by various institutions and stuff. See, now I'm starting to sound more like the anarchist by getting into the, I mean, well, Marxists do it too. I, I'm going to clear up something else, um, and I probably should have... I'm not sure if I had stated this, but I, I need to start s s being more clear about here. Um, I'm not... A, as I've said before, I'm not a Marxist-Leninist Maoist. But I have strong Marxist-Leninist Maoist leanings. And I'm also actually ridiculously pro-anarchist, and I probably haven't been very clear about that. Now, again, Dr. Abram Weisfeld does not... Endorsed Bernie Sanders. He had offered a campaign of uh, critical support. 
this has led this had led to several conversations between myself, Donna Newman, and him about what to do about the current current climate uh, of uh, of politics. Now, I have to say that Dr. Weisfeld does make a strong point when he says what is phenomenal about Bernie Sanders is that although he's not a true socialist, he is more like a social democrat at best. And I am paraphrasing him, so when he hears this, I hope he forgives me for my paraphrase, and I try to do better at, I'm trying to do better at paraphrasing. But what, it, okay, what's phenomenal about Bernie Sanders is that he ran a major election that caused new interest in socialism that has not been seen in America since the time of Eugene Debs. And that's true, although I would say that Bernie Sanders is no Eugene Debs, and that's my, that's mine, my personal critique. I will, however, say that what I think that is interesting about Bernie San Sanders is that he has been the champion of free speech. That is what I will say. That's what I like about Bernie Sanders. Before we get further into this than we already have, I think that it is important that we clear up where we stand with voting. The Bundes movement holds no endorsement, no endorsements for presidency. The Bundes movement does not recognize the United States of America as a legitimate country. What the now what the Bundes movement defends is the constitution. The con, what the Bundes movement defends is the constitutional civic rights, so as to lessen the status pressure on the oppressed minorities that live in the USA. Um. I'm, I'm just going to repeat that again, just so there is no confusion. The Bundes movement holds to no endorsements for presidency. The Bundes movement does not recognize the United States of America as a legitimate country. What the Bundes movement defends is constitutional civic rights, so as to lessen the status pressure on the oppressed minorities that live in the USA. We of the Bundes movement do not endorse American politicians. We do not endorse American politicians as we consider the United States of America to be 100% illegitimate. In fact, even more illegitimate than other, than other countries. We would put into question the existence of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. But we are way more concerned with the illegitimacy of the United States of America, which we maintain is even more illegitimate. Yes, you, one state can be even more illegitimate than another. For instance, a nation state would be more would be more illegitimate than even a federation state. But a federation state would still not be as good as a democratic federation. Regardless, we're talking about colonial state structures. The United States of America is at the top of that list. We are critical of the existence of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, but we do not recognize the United States of America in any shape or form. But as stated before, we do recognize the necessity in that context to have constitutional civic liberties, and that they must be maintained in order to alleviate the pressure that the state holds on citizenry. And immigrants are whatever and immigrants, however that is described. Of course, Mexicans are not immigrants. They are, in fact, natives, but anyway, which is another problem we have with the United States, but anyway, we have the Bundes movement do not endorse politicians, American politicians, that is. So we have the Bundes movement do not endorse American politicians. We do, however, have an options list that, sa that shall be subject 
to change and or recalled any time based on the discussions of the Vanguard Circle. To further clarify this, what we mean by options is that, as the Bundist movement does not endorse any American politician, we do understand the need for some Bundists individually to strategically vote. Yes, we do understand the need for some Bundists to individually take a position to strategically vote. So we therefore have an options list. I will now disclose to you that list. Ilhan Omar, Bernie Sanders, and Rashida Talib. I will repeat, that's Ilhan Omar, Bernie Sanders, and Rashida Talib. I, 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 the third one, I often have a hard time with her name, and I do apologize. But that's the disclosure list. If I just said disclosure list, I'm sorry, I meant options list. Now, we are talking about a united front. So, while the Bernie supporters are doing the Bernie Sanders campaigns, we should greet them. We should say nice things about Bernie Sanders, and we should promote and propagate ideas in those gatherings. We should make suggestions, and we should offer critical support to those who are involved in that campaign. Not necessarily to the person that they're voting for, but the camp of the circle that we provide permissible. So, for instance, if there, if there is an Ilan Omar campaign, we talk Ilan Omar up to certain people, and you're like, yeah, you know, she was in solidarity with Angela Davis. You know, Angela Davis, you know, the, you know, the really awesome, you know, uh, black revolutionary civil rights organizer from the Communist Party that was in solidarity with Black Panther Party. And yeah, man, she's done a lot of good, you know. And then you provide, ah, oh, but consider this, you know. And, and actually, that's a perfect door to mentioning the Black Panther Party and to mention that we have reconstructed a lot of the same things the Black Panther Party stood for. Of course, within the context of Judaism and within the context of our Black Revolutionary Allies, which I, I'm going to attempt to bring up soon. Um, with Bernie Sanders... Um, I think we do the same thing, but I, I would suggest that we start talking about socialism because the D the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, which are not really exactly so they're not really socialists. They're not even really democratic socialists because a democratic socialist would be somebody like Chris Hedges. However, a lot of these people are, are interested in socialism, and a lot of these people are decent people. You know, this is a this is a this is an opportunity for us to talk about the, the exploitation of the third world. Uh, question, get them to question why they're voting, and if they're voting, how to vote better. So it's like, step one, why, why vote at all? You know, why not just antagonize the system until it falls? And then step two, okay, if you're going to vote, why not vote this way? Why not vote in that direction? And then step three is like, you know, explain the process and, you know, the way that the mechanisms work and how to combat it from within, if that's what they're going to do, but continue to suggest otherwise, and, and, and open up the conversation of socialism. We can't be at war with the DSA. There's no point to being at war with the Democratic Socialists of America. They're not our enemies, and when it comes to eco-socialism, I think that we can actually get them involved in eco-socialism, which is going to have to be a big deal. Do you know that it's, it, it's, it's the month of May here in Arizona, and it's usually hot, but we've had a windstorm. It's been raining a couple times, and it, it, we are, we're supposed to be transitioning into the summer period out here, and we're not exactly doing that yet. That's, that's kind of weird. Um, it probably is going to come in a couple of weeks, but it's coming late for this year, which is bizarre in the state of Arizona because of the weather. But, you know, climate change, climate change exists. I have to admit that I prefer the terms planet sabotage and uh, uh, I, uh, the, the, the terms planet sabotage and uh, planet malfunction, as described by Herbert Dillon. But Dr. Weisfeld mentioned a really good word, and that was ecological suicide. All that's true. And I, I can't stand it when people deny these things. One of the things that I keep using as a joke, I mean, it's a satirical joke, that, but I do mean it when I say it. It's like, yeah, we mystics, we were saying that the, uh, the, 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 the Mother Nature, the spirit of the Earth was being destroyed systematically by humans, and eventually it would fight back against us. And now the scientists have discovered climate change. Why is it the scientists are always five steps behind us? <laughs> ha ha ha, lol, lol. But... The point to that joke is that, although it's a joke, it's just that, you know, when we talk about material conditions, if you're a climate change denial, denier, 
there is something inherently wrong with your mentality. How can you... I mean, the polar ice caps are melting. There's a big crack in the... I, okay. It actually kind of makes me angry, but... <laughs> um... So that that's how it is is that we we collectively do not endorse any campaign but we do have an options list for who you can vote for if you feel you should vote for somebody and if you are going to vote for somebody you're going to use it to the united front that's a policy that we're pushing if you decide to vote for bernie sanders you have to use it towards the united front that means you talk about the struggle of the minorities you talk about everything that is going on you talk about the machika movement you talk about uh, Panther Code, and you talk about Black Nation and Byzantine Catholic Nation, you talk about the Palestinian struggle, you talk about um, how the repression of the Eastern, of how the Eastern Christians feel by the Western Christians who misrepresent them, and talk to them about the uphill battle that that one part of the Western Church has, about how difficult it's becoming for the for the Roman Catholics to format what they've been trying to do. And I'm talking about certain Roman Catholics. There are there are certain Roman Catholics that want to dissolve the Vatican. They want to make the Pope nothing but the Bishop of Rome, as it's supposed to be for them, and you know dissolve the Vatican and you know bring out all the literature to everybody. We should talk about things like that. We should talk about the Keystone Pipeline. We should talk about the way that the fossil fuel interests are destroying the planet. We need to talk about how uh, there's a direct history correlation between capitalism and colonialism. The capitalism's precursor was actually not feudalism, it was colonialism. Yes. We, we, there's so much we can do in those situations. There needs to be a united front around the campaigning for uh, civil society to organize around certain political lines. We are not forming a vanguard party. We're not, for one thing, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't go with the concept of sovereignty as we are the Bundists. Uh, but we will join in a vanguard party with the black proletariat if that's what they want to do. They would have to start it, and if they let us join in, we will then join in. We might even just ask if, you know, I think Panther Code would let us in. Um, by the way, when I speak of Panther Code, and I wasn't planning to do all this name dropping, but I'm doing it because they are asking to be mentioned. Yes, even Byzantine Catholic Nation was asking to be mentioned. Um, the Byzantine Catholic Nation offers solidarity to the Bundist movement because they say that they consistently were attacked by the same people that we were attacked by. by. Like, we don't really particularly have a problem with Eastern Christians, but we do, however, point out that there was quite a bit of turbulence to, to one of the Eastern Christian churches, that being the Russian Orthodox Church. The Byzantine Catholic Nation, well, that's the name of a group, Byzantine Catholic Nation, but there is a such thing as Byzantine Catholic nationality. And just like us, they just as we have Jewish people who do not realize that we're part of a nation, they have Byzantine Catholics who don't realize that they are part of a nation. They have a lot of the same issues they have, they have but they want us to know that they feel the strife and uh, that 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 goes on in society today with the political sphere. And they want us to know that uh, they wanted to make this statement to us that they would like to offer the so sovereignty, which fortunately Donna Newman did reply and to say yes. They offer they, they offer their solidarity. Sorry, there's, I, if I said sovereignty there, I'm I'm sorry because I'm like trying to get this all in one, and only half of this is scripted right now. And I was I I actually lost four of the papers. I had to get something out of the out of Donna's car. The Byzantine. Ca okay, well here's here's part. Okay, the Byzantine Catholic nation offers its solidarity to the Bundist movement as uh, the I quote we Byzantine Catholics just as you the Jewish people have undergone consistent repression from both the Roman Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church we have this sorry we share this in common with you and we have the utmost respect for what you're doing now I have met several Byzantine Catholics and I will say that they are worth the effort a lot of these people are from the Ukraine. Some of them are of very much Arab descent. Good people. Like the Jewish people, they're not based on culture and ethnicity. They are based on culture and religion. Now, the next thing that I need to clarify here is that the 
the concept of whiteness, which a lot of people who saw uh, us speak before uh, in Glendale um, were cheering on what we were saying. We noticed that we did the same exact thing in Peoria and that we were booed off the stage. And this has to do with the semantics issue and proper definition, and we do have to get this correct. All right, so let me start by saying, on the concept of whiteness, just to clarify, whiteness, the white concept, white is in its origins. So this is so, I will say, I don't disagree with Dr. Arpen Weisfeld when he says that it's actually West, Western Christian supremacy. That is true. That is how it is in origins, but it can leave Western Christianity and go into atheism and agnosticism. This gets into another reason why Frederick Danson's work is so crucial. Frederick Danson was consistently referencing Dr. Abram Weisfeld. In his thesis, National Cultural Autonomy, which hasn't been fully published, but some of the chapters have already been published, Frederick Danson mentions that white is Eurocentricity and white supremacy is Eurochauvinism. This being based in colonialism. Colonialism is rooted in the Spanish Inquisition, by the way. In fact, that's where the notion of race came from. There's no such thing as race. There's ethnicity continuation of a people through heredity, basically. That's ethnicity. Some nations are based on ethnicity and culture. Now, as far as black people are concerned, not all black people use the term black to describe. Some prefer to use the term African or African American. But one of the reasons why several of us in the, uh, the Buddhist movement have struggled on the side of referring to black as black as opposed to just saying African is because the black revolutionaries have dialectically done much to explain that black people are the descendants of the slaves and that they were sold primarily by Africans to Europeans so that they, in, in the terms of ethnicity they are African but in terms of culture they are a distinct culture and that they you know have self-determination, or as 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 uh, Black Nation puts it, auto-determination. Yes, they refer to themselves as Black, being separate from just Africans, and having auto-determination. When they're intertwining with us, we should be allowed to adopt Black dialectics and in an exchange show them what it means to use reciprocity. That exchange is necessary for the Black-Jewish connection. So when the reference of whiteness was referred, it needs to be understood that that is a reference to colonialism, and that is also a reference to the white Christian supremacist power structure. Now, getting further into this, whiteness is now kind of an empty shell. It keeps finding ways of preserving itself when its structure falls apart. So, atheism and agnosticism emerged during the Enlightenment movement. Those philosophies are rejected by the Buddhist movement, but we don't reject an atheist or an agnostic. You understand? We don't reject an agnostic or an atheist. We don't even reject an irreligious atheist or an irreligious agnostic. We reject those that are involved in atheism and agnosticism. Why would you practice, for instance, atheism, why would you practice not believing? It doesn't make sense. You just don't believe then if that's the case. With agnosticism, why would you practice not knowing? I, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why would it not, That's why most agnostics have completely left agnosticism, because it's just absurd for them. An agnostic is someone, let's clarify this, there's other ways of saying it, but this is the best way I know how to say it. And I, and I do say this to people so I can explain the difference. An agnostic is someone who believes although there can be no proof for God. And this is what an agnostic, this is their stance. I don't hold this stance. But this is the true agnostic stance, and I respect the true agnostic stance, and it deserves that respect. The agnostic maintains... The agnostic maintains that Although there would be no proof for God, 
they can't outrule the possibility that God exists. Or, I don't even want to say God. The agnostic does not deny... The, 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 an agnostic does not believe that there can be proof for divinity, yet they do not deny the possibility of, div of divinity. So, agnostics maintain that divinity can't be known, but and that is kind of irrelevant to speak of it, and it's out of the question. Yet, at the same time, what, what that really means is they, they don't believe... Okay, agnostics maintain that the concept of divinity uh, cannot, can never be proven. But thus, it can't really be disproven because they can't rule out the possibility that there is such a notion. That, 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 that they can't rule out that possibility. So the possibility is not ruled out, but it's not breached upon. The reason why it's not breached upon is because it's not something concrete. For them, at least. But that stance should be respected because if you're going by science, actually the agnostic position is pretty strong. I'm not saying that you have to be an agnostic if you're a scientist. I'm saying that that position is probably the most logical. I'd say that even more with atheism, and that's just my opinion on that. I'm not insulting Marion Emmesberg, who is an atheist, by the way. Um, now, an atheist rejects the existence of divinity. You could even go further and say re rejection of divinity and supernatural, but, but that gets into deeper layers that I'm not going to get into. But an atheist is someone who rejects divinity. Why would you practice not believing? That doesn't make sense. You just wouldn't believe. Why would you practice um, not knowing? That doesn't make sense. So atheism, there's no place for it. It's part of it's part of whiteness. And if you're not white, or if you're not European, in other words, and you're into the white culture, you're colonized then. So within the white structures, there's the white and the colonized, but the white is not necessarily anything but a lie. That's what whiteness is. Whiteness is a false consciousness. So when the critique of whiteness was being given in the previous videos, what was being described as colonialism, and it is white. It is a supremacist nature. It is a false consciousness. Blackness exists. Whiteness does not exist. Blackness is development of the African slaves who are a new African nation who went, want to build, some of them want to build bridges back to Africa by engaging with Pan-Africanism, and that's where you get into the concept of Afro-unity. Afro-unity refers to when, um, particularly in America and Canada, when black Americans and African Americans join together, or black Canadians and African Canadians join together in a unified system, and that's Afro-unity. That's so in that sense you can call them Afro Americans and Afro Canadians and a lot of them do embrace that term because that connects them. Um, I think that Ella Umar is a symbol for that for Afro unity. She is a symbol for the Afro American sis, uh, not system. I don't want to say that. That's not that's not dialectically correct in this context. Um, she is a symbol of liberation. And that's why we don't want to completely turn off the progressives. We don't want to turn off Bernie Sanders supporters. We don't want to, you know, and, and you know, kind of, I kind of like Bernie Sanders myself, honestly. I, 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 I'll be honest, I would not vote for him. Because I would not vote for anybody. I just don't do that. But I like the guy. I disagree with his neutrality and his pro-light liberal Zionism. But, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that Hillary was not being aggressive in the campaigns against the occupation where he was. She totally ousted herself with that. He kicked her butt in that campaign. And although it's sad that he doesn't support BDS, nonetheless, he supported the constitutional right to have it. He championed our right to boycott. He stood with Ila um Omar, you know? So, he does deserve certain respect. We respect him within the context of this imperial republic. We respect him. And we do see an opportunity, not opportunism, we see an opportunity to, when the, when, when the Sanders supporters are doing their campaign, to talk to them about United Front and about socialism and tell them, if you still plan to vote, this is how you vote. And if a Bundist does vote for Sanders... A Bundist should be guiding them on what critiques to make to Sanders and what to say to Sanders. And, you know, 
this is how we deal with it. So we have those options of who you can vote for. You, um, we don't. The Bundes movement cannot endorse by principle anyone, but individually we'll let people vote for this. We do ban the voting of mainstream candidates, though. It is prohibited by the vanguard circle for Bundists to vote for mainstream Democrat and Republican candidates. So far we have these three candidates in the Democrat Party that we have given an approval towards. Not endorsement, but approval. approval. And there is a difference. We give not endorsement, but approval. And anyone who wants to critically support, they have the approval to do so. If, but, but the rule is you have to use it towards the United Front. Because there is an opportunity. Dr. Weisfeld, his proposal has a logic to it that we are coming to understand a bit more. I kind of understood it to begin with, but I was a little hazy myself. This is an opportunity for the United Front, for minorities. Especially because we do think that Sanders does care about minorities. We actually do think that. One of our top critiques, though, is we don't really think he gives much concern to the third world. Although, in the context of the South American struggles, I think he is a bit more sympathetic, at least. And I think he is sympathetic to foreign struggles, but I don't think that he's properly educated on that, and I don't think that he understands the bigger picture to a lot of these things. But as far as civil rights go, I think Bernie Sanders is promising. We are entering a new civil rights struggle. We are in a new civil, we are in a second civil rights movement, and that's what we've recognized. But we don't want to just stop there, we want to go to revolution. Because the civil rights movement was lost because of all these concessions and the buying into the system, and you can't buy into a first world imperialist system of the Occidental system. Occidental first, Occidental first world nation state superstructures are disastrous that have had heavy consequences on the whole world and the environment. But strategy, as our strategies evolve, we have, to, we have to take these things into the consideration. Now, for those of us who also do not vote, who choose to maintain not to vote, we should still not in any way marginalize Sanders supporters. In fact, we should do everything we can to talk to them about um, class struggle, about social orders, about colonized people and what it and what it means to liberate to, to be decolonized and how to uh, fight back and struggle what legal deterrence would look like I mean it is legal for the most part if a person does for instance um, get voted in let's say in the Democrat or Republican party somebody got voted in and your guy got voted in but they give the can they give the they give the vote to somebody else kind of like how they did with Hillary over Sanders it is legal to occupy the building with firearms and demand your person in now the content that i just gave is not very friendly to a lot of people's ears but it's still constitutionally correct nonetheless treason is written into the constitution One of the other critiques we give to Bernie Sanders is we do not, and we never will, never will support gun control. Gun control is right-wing, 100% right-wing. You cannot disarm the proletariat. And by the way, the proletariat does not necessarily mean the working class. The proletariat is he or she who is exploited. He, she, they who are exploited, that is the proletariat. And then I'm going to now also mention a clarification on my statements that I gave on behalf of us as we felt we feel very frustrated with the very existence of Chabad but we did condemn the shootings but I need to clarify this the Buddhist movement is not against Chabad philosophy or the theological positions of Chabad Lubavitch that is not the problem the Buddhist movement has the Buddhist movement has three problems with the organization of Chabad the first is that is the is the the first is the fraction that considers Schneerston the Messiah. We denounce them. The second is their neutrality towards Zionism, which 
does equate for many of them complete and total pro-Zionism. The, the third critique, not, not critique, the third opposition we have, it's not even a critique. Let, let, in fact, I'm just, just for the sake of that, I, I, let, me, let me clarify. We oppose the organization of Chabad Lubavitch. We condemn the attack towards their shul, their synagogue, and we do not denounce the people that go to a Chabad shul. We denounce the organization of Chabad Lubavitch. It is not a Jewish organization. We denounce it. Just as Dr. Weisfeld denounced Zionists that were occupying the West Bank. We denounce the, the sect, the break-off cultish sect that considers Snearsden the Messiah. And we denounce the Chabad organization in their, in their dealings with Zionism. And we denounce their mafia activities. We also denounce their participation in high electoral politics in this imperial government, which is peculiar to the rest of the Haredi deem who consistently consider Chabad not Jewish. And this is why we do stand with, we do stand with the Haredi deem on a lot of the major issues. And we stand, and we recognize Nechiri Karta as the leaders of our generation, and we know Nechiri Karta is not very impressed with Chabad Lubavitch either. Now, again, we, we will hope that this clarifies a lot. We do not condemn people who go to Chabad Lubavitch. That's why we are going to take over the modern Orthodox institutions. Because Judaism is Orthodox Judaism. We do recognize Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism and Reconstructionist Judaism as Judaism, but we see them as watered-down Judaism. And we support the, the, the clarifying that three of our council members are seek to do. We support Marvin Eliyahu and his re-clarification for what Reconstructionist Judaism should be. We support Hannah Toff and what her re-clarification uh, to Conservative Judaism should be. And we support Uri Adi and his uh, re-clarification to what Reform Judaism should be. And that is their less, lesser observant versions of Judaism. That should respect Orthodox leadership. without compromising their personal ethics, of course. Which, their ethics will still tie into Jewishness, which is what matters. If you uh, haven't uh, seen this book, um, I do suggest you should purchase it. This is uh, the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations by Dr. Abram Weisfeld. A very important read and it offers an actual solution to the issue which no one has been able to solve largely because well, I mean well Gaddafi did touch upon the issue although Dr. Weisfeld's advancement is more advanced and I think that this is really good I mean using Gaddafi's literature is important and expanding upon it is important because there were a lot of things Gaddafi left unfinished oh yeah no I love the fan yeah, the office is looking much better now, since uh, the window was fixed. Right. So by the way, in case you're wondering, um, because in the two previous films of, you know, Bundist political awareness, uh, at the beginning of both part one and part two of Bundist political awareness, we had Donna Newman give her presentation with me, giving her, uh, uh, you know, but she's going to be at the very end before we cut to the end of this trilogy and to our feature presentation. She's going to be at the very end of it. Uh, she's been very stressed. Um, I have too, so if I sound a little not so super happy, it's actually not because I'm actually that, de I mean, well, whether I'm depressed or not is not something I want to get to, what I, what I want to let you know is like my voice is shot because I've been doing a lot of talking, and um, talking to civil liberties uh, lawyers, uh, we had to make a contact with the police, who we don't trust, 
uh, for them sort of to laugh in our face, but we do have somebody that can help us fight back on this cause. We have a problem in the United States where people do disappear, um, but it usually is reported. In Arizona, people disappear and then they're never heard from again. Sometimes even the very record of their existence gets erased. There are judges and lawyers who will actually erase birth records and burn affidavits and delete them from computer records and files at very high level even at times. One must never forget that this is the state that had Ger Sh Sheriff Joe Arpaio in it. That same sheriff, yes, who was seen in public hugging neo-Nazis. Well, there's two sides to Arizona. There's the Bohemian side, which should be used to tap into the integrated poor, but then there's the fascist side. On the one hand, you know, yeah, you got police who pretty much will be afraid of arresting Jewish Europeans because of being sued, but then there's other police with a certain audacity, and what's really happening is, is that the police are getting worse, but we saw signs of this 17 years ago, 12 years ago, five years ago, and it's been increasing. It's on a steady upward, you know. That's how it's been. You know, I like the fan more than the AC. The AC was crap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe a new AC would be... I, I don't like to be relying on AC. You know, air conditioning is kind of, you know, an overprivileged... I mean, I get it in Arizona, but, you know, Arizona would be fine without the cement, the asphalt... Why do you get to smoke in your room of the office? I... Alright, whatever you say. Nobody has a problem with your voice. Right, she will be speaking at the end of the presentation. She's, And she would probably speak more, but, you know, there's a lot of trauma. There's been some attempts on her life recently, and um, we found out... Um, more well I mean I was somewhat privy to a clandestine activity that was going on on Facebook concerning the Libria Consolidation Party of course she's the one who really cracked it open Donna Newman I find to be essential to our work so I'm gonna give everybody a preview here So, some previews that uh, we give um, in order so that you may know what to expect from the Boondis movement. Um, what's coming soon? Donna Newman's commentary on Trotsky's permanent revolution. The signs given to show how revolutions break out all over the world in an ongoing process must be taken to a new context. The Arab Spring is a great example. This book will also investigate the way imperialist powers repress, co-opt, and stage this even sometimes, so that it will also be pretty much not taken seriously. So while there's an Arab Spring going on, uh, her book also talks about how intelligence and military will go in to start a fake revolution, and then people lose all um, morale about such revolution in the Arab Spring. But the Arab Spring, she points to as a prime example of per of what, wh how, how permanent revolution would break out. She was inspired, these, these notions that inspired her actually came straight from Dr. Abram Weisfeld. Because one thing that you have to understand about Dr. Weisfeld is he takes Trotsky's permanent revolution and actually puts it in a context that actually works. That's one of the reasons why certain Trotskyists don't like him, because they're opportunists. The Trotskyists that we're having issues with in the Libri Consolidation Party, I will vouch and say, not not vouch, I will say, don't be mistaken, these people are Trotskyists. There is a such thing as lunatic fringe Trotskyists, just as there are lunatic fringe anarchists and lunatic fringe Marxist-Leninists. They exist. They can't possibly speak for the broader Fourth International, though. I seriously don't believe that. I don't think anybody actually believes that. Just like there's no way that Hochism speaks for Marxism-Leninism. That's impossible. Marxism-Leninism, with their dialectical logic, they couldn't go by with Hochism. 
I'm not saying Ever Hoja did nothing wrong, but you know, I, I, I agree with Jason Unger on that. He was largely a racist, which there should be no place for that in the Marxist Leninist communities. Anyway, another book by Donna Newman is her Compound Synthesis, which has parts of the works of Huey P. Newton, or from Huey P. Newton, uh, Rudolf Rocker's book, pieces of Rudolf Rocker's book, Anarcho Syndicalism Theory and Practice, uh, Jason Unruh's book, Maoism Third Worldism, The Fourth Stage of Marxist Theory and some others that are not to be mentioned right now. You'll just have to wait until those books come out. And of course, The Manifesto by Dr. Abram Weisfeld, Donna Newman, myself, Hannah Toff, Isaiah B. Kamenstein, Miriam Emmesberg, Uri Adia, and Marvin Eliyahu. Now on The Manifesto, what to expect within The Manifesto, uh, Donna Newman will be writing on material solidarity between mystics and scientists and uh, she's producing work within there on solidarity with the oppressed now by the way just just a disclaimer so that people don't think that this is fringe thinking the importance of the solidarity to between materialists and science uh, sorry the, the solidarity between mystics and scientists is essential as I did to explain or get into without getting into it I, I got into a bit of where what my mystical point of view is it just so happens that I have permission now to express something from Donna Newman that her personal position does uh, go into mysticism and science although she professes herself as a modern Orthodox Jewish woman who believes in Hashem she does accept mysticism and science so she can clarify as I've said before, real mysticism has, you know, although it gets in the supernatural, it, uh, it is grounded in materialism, and we wouldn't have a problem with a scientist. So she, like me, has issues with creation science. She has issues with metaphysics. That's why we detest Hegel. You'll find that there are Bundists in the Bundist movement that will use just a sliver of Hegel for research reasons or for reasons of study, but nobody in the Bundist movement likes George William Frederick Hegel. And I, and I had said before that I hold in common with Dr. Abram Weisfeld uh, how much we detest George William Frederick Hegel, but Donna Newman also feels the same way. We don't like Hegel. We find Hegel to be completely disgusting. Hegel spews up the ultimate garbage that, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. I have a hard time understanding the wisdom of some others that would say that we need to read Hegel, but... I'm open to that, and I even took some script from some members of the Bundist movement in um, in one of the uh, videos we did, expressing that at least a fourth of him is worth it. I'd say I, I'd say that they've reconsidered the position at least to a seventh's worth. Maybe that would be. It, it, it's 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 not that important. Anyway, yeah, Donna will be writing on the material solidarity between mystics and scientists. From what I understand, in a way, I was almost as flipping the bird at George William Frederick Hegel because of our distaste for metaphysics. Uh, work on solidarity will be in there with the oppressed, exploited, third and fourth world struggles. This is what to expect from her from the manifesto. My part will include the proper definition of Judaism, Jewishness, who are the Samaritans within the Jewish nation? What is their uh, relationship to us in the Bund? And other factors relating to Jewish matters. Now, myself, Donna, and A.B. have together written on the matters pertaining to social orders and class division. That's not exactly what it is titled, and we don't plan to say the titles on media. You will just have to wait until we get it out there, okay? There is also the work on antisemitism that we kind of tried to get uh, A.B. to take credit for, but it was really an another piece by Donna, myself, and uh, in collaboration with A.B. We've decided that, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll abide by his wishes and mention it. The thing is, is that we've all written individual part to it, so we have a plan. Don't worry, A.B. <laughs> Me and Donna have an idea. You will like this idea. That's the, that's the crazy thing. You're going to love this. Yeah, I mean, you're going to really love this, Dr. Weisfeld. Um, we know what we really need you to personally, on your own, write 
for this for this uh, this manifesto. And um, if this manifesto kicks off, we, we might make a documentary based on the manifesto. That's what we'd like in the works. But you don't have to worry, Ibi. Me and uh, <laughs> me and Donna, uh, we have we have something you will like. You're gonna love this. And as far as uh, what that is, everybody, we're not gonna tell you. We're gonna tell it to Dr. Weisfeld before you ever hear about it. Deal with it. <gasps> I will be taking complaints about my sectarical humor from anybody that gives it to me, and I'll be taking compliments, and we'll decide if we should go with that. Um, it's sometimes difficult when one is in trauma to go forward with these presentations. Dr. Weisfeld, um, after being tortured and detained, uh, detained and tortured, he he's uh, dealing with a lot. Plus, he's on fast, so a lot of things are very frustrating. Donna Newman. Her health problems are increasing due to stress, and I'm becoming extremely agitated from all the pressures everywhere. Uh, not to mention, I, I almost was not able to uh, bring my firstborn child home from school on her last day of school for fifth grade. I did do it, though, but it almost did not happen. So anyway, from Hannah, so within the manifesto, from Hannah Toff shall come a 12-point program for the Bundist movement. Hannah Toff will also have something written on conservative Judaism. But what I'm looking forward to seeing is her work on the strategic projects that she has in mind, that she's uh, that she's almost done with. Um, she tells me she's almost done with it, and uh, I, I've i seen previews to some of her stuff, but I have not gotten a sneak peek at uh, this, her strategic projects thing. In fact, Donna Newman hasn't either. She's given us somewhat of a roundabout idea, and we get really excited about that. And again, Dr. Weisbaum will hear of that before anybody else does. Ha! Huh? Now, from Isaiah P. Cometstein, a written work on committees and what that really means to for the Jewish people. Uh, this will include the Jewish Committee for LGBT. Uh, the Jewish committee, the Jewish committee for the criminal underworld. Now, so that you don't freak out here, uh, this will talk about, uh, or this will, it will be written. This basically explains uh, who is friend and who is foe in the context of outlaws, and um, it will also have within it uh, the, the, the 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 Jewish committee for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this is extremely necessary, by the way because we have a very turbulent history with the Roman Catholic Church, and there are Roman Catholics who consistently try to reach out to us. The Roman Catholic Church is forced to face the fact that all the whiteness started from their community. See, the thing to understand, um, I'm going to be going over, the, I'm going to finish the script with the, um, the problem of white supremacy, but I would like to clarify again, whiteness in origin came from the Western Church. And actually, if you really want to get into it, it starts with it really starts with the Inquisition and the notion of race. Whiteness is not like blackness. Blackness is a consciousness that the descendants of the slaves have. Whereas whiteness is an indoctrination, which origins come from the Western Christian supremacist system. When the Western Christian supremacist system uh, got stronger through the Inquisition. Uh, this is what gave birth to the notion of race and colonialism. This is in some way reflected in the book Settlers, which I'm reading right now. By the way, the, the, um, the, I mean, I read from it from, in part one and part two, and here in part three, the final conclusion, I will finish reading it, but I'll give commentary, I'll give more direct commentary, because I was giving commentary before, but I'm going to give more direct commentary this time to it so that you may know um, what it's about. Now, it does, by the way, conclude, and just letting you know before I end up reading it, it does conclude with, it does conclude with the fact that whiteness is a complete fabrication, and why there's such a necessity among the Eurocentric people to, not Europeans, Eurocentric-minded people to try to preserve it. There are other manifestations that have a caught that have happened from this Eurocentricity, but it is 
its origins are in the Western Church, and it is still highly prevalent in the Western Church, especially among Protestant groups, as in fact, the newer Protestant groups more so, and definitely among the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. There's nothing sectarian, as, uh, there's nothing sectarian about um, going against organized atheism or organized agnosticism or going against these Western Christian institutional groups that exist. There is something wrong with going after an atheist or an agnostic because those are stances. But why, again, why practice being an atheist when you're just an atheist? Or why practice being an agnostic when you're just agnostic? You could be irreligious. Now, people hate it when I say the word irreligious, a lot of people, but it's a correct term. There are irreligious atheists. An irreligious atheist doesn't have to engage in atheism. By the way, we also disrespect Nietzsche. I, I have to say it. It's like sometimes you just have to stick it to these to these racialist people, you know, because there is no race. It doesn't exist. There's ethnicity, but ethnicity is not really built on DNA. It's built on the continuation of people. Yeah, there's hereditary traits you'll see as, but uh, anyway. Hegel has a lot to do with the furthering development of that crap, too. But anyway, so yeah, Isaiah P. Comenstein, he, you know, one of the committees that he touches upon is the Roman Catholic Church, and you know, yes, they started it. They aren't, not all of them continue it, and many of them are trying to cleanse it, but and it was born out of largely illiteracy and power structure people who came up with ways to maintain power. Why did they have to maintain that power? Because the Islamic world was, in, 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 in technological terms, way far more advanced than they were. And more ethically sound, too, because when you have a literate culture, or a literate society, more accurately, I guess I'd say, in the Muslim context, because there would be several Muslim cultures, but Islam itself is, is, is not a country, per se. Anyway, I mean, it's an inclusive religion, technically. Um, I, I might be saying that incorrectly, but the point I'm saying is that Islam is, is a religion, but it's not a cultural religion, so it doesn't actually, it, it, there's no national Islam. Uh, however, there are Islamic cultures that exist, just as there are... Uh, well, a a anyway, there are no. Anyway, the further dynamics of this will be touched upon also in the manifesto. And if you want any sense of where the direction of that goes, watch the documentary Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement. Among Isaiah P. Kamenstein's part in the manifesto is his work on the black Jewish relations, uh, which will include an understanding of Jewish blacks and Jewish Africans, and the context of Afro-nationality and Afro-unity, and what the difference between black nationals and Africans really is, and how they, can, and how they end up, uh, in many cases, as they, sh as they should, according to Isaiah P. Comenstein, unite under this Afro-unity, to do this, you have to resolve the contradictions. To do this, there needs to be an understanding of what blackness actually is. And the, he says this very strongly, as does uh, Panther Code, as does Black Nation, who we find ourselves consistently in solidarity with. And we, I would say that they are proof of the validity of Dr. Weisfeld's need for the United Front, which is all of our needs. We all need the concept of that. We saw it with uh, Fred Hampton's Rainbow Co Coalition, and I denounced the notion that it was a failure. The truth is, Hugh P. Newton um, was good, but I would say that Fred Hampton was better. That's in my opinion, though. I will admit that. That one was exclusively my opinion. Uh, but uh, Isaiah P. Comenstein's uh, work will also include his uh, writings on and his, his writing and uh, uh, his writing on Reconstructionist Judaism. And then from Uri Adia, commentary on Joseph Stalin's book Marxism and the National Question, work on the true nature, work on the his work exquisite, uh, work on the true nature of nations, uh, work on the compatibility with the Jewish nation and with other nations, and uh, his own advocacy on national cultural autonomy, and that is really good. I mean, he doesn't just advocate for it. You, you realize the logic of national cultural autonomy by reading through this. It's stuff that he wrote on there. I mean, the stuff that he really wrote on there, guys, it's, it's really good. And he also wrote some work 
on Reform Judaism. And then from Marvin Eliyahu, writings on world division, that what to do uh, when building certain foundations up for, um, uh, you know, networking. Basically, okay, there are writings on world division. Uh, let me see that. No, there's a coffee stain on it. It's, it's okay. I, no, no, don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> I was the one that made the big mess this morning, so why you, you apologize too much, I swear. Writings on Marvin Elias writings on world division. What to do to build on forming public forums on unite on world un, unified coexistence. Uh, let me say that again. Right, writings on world division and what to do on building public forums on world unified coexistence. He has also written about which will be in the manifesto. Uh, he has also written about his. Uh, uh, sorry, he is currently writing. He is currently also writing for the manifesto. Uh, a particular diagnosis he has given to the Zionist brainwashing and where uh, capitalism is most vulnerable, which is good to know on how to overcome capitalism. And then from Miriam Emmisberg. Miriam Emmisberg uh, has produced a written denunciation of Karl Marx. Jewish question. So, you, Carl, not, not, you know, it's sad for me that I've seen. Have you noticed this too? That a lot of the Marxists don't even know that there that Marx wrote something called the Jewish question. But anyway, um, yeah. So she she has written a denunciation of Karl Marx's Jewish his his book, the Jewish question. She's written an entire denunciation on it which will be in the manifesto, commentary work on Frederick Danson, Herbert Dillon, Marcus Dinjamal, and Shabazz Dinjamal. That's cool. A historical, she's also written for it, for the manifesto, a historical world outlook from the Asian and African point of view that discredits Eurocentric historical revisions. She is also currently writing on the historical revisions of Marx and Engels and some of the historical revisions that have been produced by di various anarchist writers. Oh, it doesn't say various anarchist writers, it's some of the anarchist writers. I kind of hope it's various anarchist writers. So. I uh, I hope that you um, are all looking forward to that, and let me see what the title of this is going to be, because it's important that I put out the titles. When we were first starting to do these, th this uh, Dr. Weisfeld had said that it's very important that when me and Donna are putting these films together that we um, mention the dates and the titles of the videos credification and so people can if they need to go find them on their own they can and we've been attempt we, we've been doing our best to do that ever since and it does seem to work pretty well it's like it's come become like natural to us and um is it on your computer because that's going to make it really difficult for me to if it's on your computer instead no no wait i know it files in i'm sorry Um, no, no, I got it. I, I swear I got it. Yeah, because you have it at the back of the file, that's why. I remember where it is now, okay? I mean, I got it, I got it, I got it. I swear I got it. <laughs> You know, if we can get this video finished by the deadline that uh, you had suggested, I will in fact buy you coffee. Okay. 
from the Real News Network. Oh, now we're going to bring you to a uh, a video from the Real News Network, um, the Real News Network, and it's called Ilhan Omar's denunciation of Israel lobby is not anti-Semitism. And this was published on March 5th of 2000. Nineteen. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you with us. Ilhan Omar is under attack once again for allegedly saying that Jews have dual loyalties, which is an old anti-Semitic trope. If she had said that, then she should rightly be forced to address those comments. But she didn't say that. She's being once again accused of anti-Semitism, with right-wing Republicans calling for her to be ousted from the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Democratic leadership sponsoring a new bill against anti-Semitism that doesn't mention Ilhan Omar's name, but clearly is directed at her. A political and generational divide is building around this, around Israel and Palestine, in the midst of the reality of increasing anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in our country. And joining us now once again is Phyllis Bennis, who is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, serves on the board of Jewish Voices for Peace, her most recent book is the seventh updated edition of Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a primer. And Phyllis, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Good to be with you, Mark. For everybody watching, I want to play this short clip uh, that started all this off. This Ilhan Omar was, along with uh, other co congressional representatives, was at Buffalo and Poets, uh, where she made this statement, very clearly saying she was not anti-Semitic, that, that her feelings about the Jewish community, and had this to say. that says it is okay for people to push for allegiance to a foreign country. I want to ask, why is it okay for me to talk about the influence of the NRA, of fossil fuel industries or big pharma, and not talk about a powerful lobbying group that is influencing policy? So, Phyllis, were you there that night? This has happened? I was. Okay. I was sitting just a few feet away. So, talk a bit about what happened that evening and what you think the response really was. Or what, I mean, why it took place, what it really meant. What occurred It was here? an extraordinary moment, Mark. And you, you could hear it from the applause at the beginning. There were hundreds of people crammed into the room. This was weeks after the, the last set of attacks against Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Again, allegedly for anti-Semitism where essentially she is being attacked by members, in this case, of her own party, for anti-Semitism that she never expressed, for supposed anti-Jewish prejudice that she never held, and for hatred of Jews that she doesn't hold and never said. So it was important, it was the reason that we went through and, and actually transcribed what she did say in, in answer to this. It was clear she was talking about the pro-Israel lobby. That's not the Jews. The pro-Israel lobby includes organizations like KUFI, Christians United for Israel, which is one of the most influential and wealthiest of the lobby groups that, like all lobbies, that's what they do, they use money to win points in Congress. That's what they do. That's how the lobbying system works. APAC is no different. What was going on here was a very powerful and indeed passionate articulation of Ilhan Omar's own experiences as being, as she described it, part of a religion that has been marginalized, a people that is often treated as second-class citizens. You know, because keep in mind, Mark, we're talking about a Muslim woman, a covered Muslim woman, right. a black woman, an African immigrant, a refugee from Somalia. These are all categories which even individually, let alone collectively, a lot of people in Congress, in the White House, in the media, and elsewhere in the country think do not belong in Congress. And when you have one person who personifies all of that, as well as being a strong, tough, outspoken woman, that woman is going to face enormous challenges. And that was a big part of what Ilhan spoke about that night. She talked about the death threats that she gets every day. Just in the last few hours, I was seeing coverage in, in one of the New York papers that the FBI is investigating another assassination threat against her. This is what she is facing on a daily basis. 
And I think we have to be clear here. She did not talk about Jews being uh, uh, having dual loyalty. She didn't talk about prejudicial attitudes. And yet that's the language that's in this democratically uh, initiated resolution that's going to be voted on tomorrow that on its face, oh, well, it's against anti-Semitism. Fine, we're all against anti-Semitism. I'm Jewish, you're Jewish. We've fought against anti-Semitism for years right. in the context of fighting against white supremacy and racism. But this isn't about what she said. It's about who she is. It's about the fact that she is a Muslim African immigrant, a Somali refugee, who is talking about Palestinian rights, who is talking about the power of the Israel lobby and the big pharma lobby and the, uh, um, the lobby for fossil fuels. And that's not okay. That's not okay. And that's why she's facing death threats. It's why she's not getting support enough from the Democratic Party. It's, she's not getting any support from the leadership. She's getting support from the progressive members of the Democratic Party. But that's not enough. That's not good enough. So what, what do we know about this bill that's in Congress that's going to be voted on tomorrow? I mean, everybody's talking about this bill coming up, put out by the, put out by the, uh, the Democratic leadership. It does not mention Ilhan Omar, as you said, by name, but clearly this came on the heels of this latest attack because of the words that she did not say. So what's in this bill? What are they saying in this bill? They're saying things like anti-Semitism is bad. Okay, we all agree with that. One of the references is to the decision by the uh, the Department of Education to accept for their own use a very contested definition of anti-Semitism that, among other things, includes specific kinds of criticism of Israel, whereas the vast majority of people do not believe that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. There have been a number of important uh, Jewish organizations and Jewish individuals in the last couple of days who have issued statements saying exactly that, that not only the, the broad point, criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism. It's criticism of what the Israeli state does, primarily to Palestinians. But some of them are also saying that this is a situation where many in the Democratic Party are delighted to have somebody who looks like Ilhan Omar in their party. It makes them look very diverse, mm -hmm. but they don't want to hear diverse views on this issue. So... Uh, you know, I'm really interested in what this might really portend for where this could be taking us. I mean, you saw the most extreme attacks like this poster uh, that popped up in West Virginia uh, and the, if, uh, that get kind of tied Ilhan Omar to the 9-11 attacks. You've got this tweet that, that uh, Ilhan Omar uh, put out about that moment that we're going to show you here on the screen. Um, and then you have the response from uh, Nita Lowry that's up there, which says lawmakers must be able to debate without prejudice or bigotry. I am saddened that Representative Omar continues to mischaracterize support for Israel. I urge it to retract this statement and engage in further dialogue with the Jewish community uh, on why these comments are so hurtful. In response to Ilhan Omar's tweet, which was, our democracy is built on debate. Congresswoman, I should not be expected to have allegiance, pledge, support to any foreign country in order to serve my country in Congress or serve on committee. The people of the fifth elected me to serve their interest. I am sure we agree on that. So, I mean, this it was is an extraordinary moment because it was very clear. There was no doubt that her reference was to the pro-Israel lobbies, including groups like Kofi, Kofi and the other Christian organizations, the who are not Jewish. organizations who are not Jewish. And what she was talking about was the pressure that is brought to bear on members of Congress. She was talking about members of Congress, not Jews, who are forced to pledge some kind of affiliation, support, loyalty, whatever you want to call it, to Israel to maintain the privileging of Israel in U.S. foreign policy. $38 billion a year that was granted over a 10-year period. $3.8 billion of our tax money every year that goes directly to the Israeli military. And that they are expected to go to Israel uh, on APAC-sponsored tours. They are expected to show up at the APAC dinner every year. These are expectations of all members of Congress. That was what she was referring to. She wasn't talking about any individual people, Jews or otherwise, having so-called dual loyalty. She was talking about the kind of pressure that is brought to bear on members of Congress to be uncritically supportive of Israel, a kind of pressure that does not exist 
for any other country in the world. Now, finally, this bill that's going to be for Congress tomorrow will most likely pass. Certainly. Up, right? And so, but it also, there seems to be a huge divide happening inside the Democratic Party and within the progressive community around yes. this issue. So I, I wonder, you know, I mean, you've been covering this for years. This is one of the things you know a lot about. What do you see happening here? What do you see the future hold? For the, I well, know you're not prescient, but I mean, what do you think the no. future holds? Well, I think in a certain way, this is actually has some good news in it. The good news is that the response to this new latest attack on Ilhan Omar has engendered an enormous level of public engagement on the issue. People are suddenly talking about what is and is not anti-Semitism. Is criticism of Israel anti-Semitic or not? The New York Times, just a few hours ago, had published an extraordinary piece that, where the title was some version of why the current controversy over Ilhan Omar opens up the question of whether AIPAC is in fact too powerful or too influential. And the article pretty much answers it in the affirmative. The article includes numerous interviews with staff members of AIPAC who are talking, essentially bragging about how it was their initiative to make members of Congress go after Ilhan Omar after her, her statements went public. They're saying, we did this. AIPAC did this. If you wanted evidence of the kind of power that AIPAC can bring to bear against members of Congress, there it is in the pages of the New York Times. So that's a good thing. We're seeing an extraordinary level of engagement because what the pro-Israel lobby has been facing for the last five years or six years or eight years is the beginnings, and it's now moving right into the center, of a generational split where young people, particularly young Jews, and particularly progressive young Jews, Democrats who are young Jews, do not have the same assumption about their support for Israel that you and I did growing up. We all assume that if you're Jewish, you support Israel. That's what it was. Now that's no longer the case. Young Jews growing up have choices. They have a right, a left, and a center. They can join, if not now. They can be part of the biggest organization in the Jewish community these days in terms of, of how fast it's growing, Jewish Voice for Peace that supports rights of Palestinians. They have choices that you and I never had as young people. And that's making all the difference in the world. Part of the reason that we're seeing this escalation in attacks on Ilhan Omar, in broader attacks on other supporters of Palestinian rights, whether it's Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, or others, is precisely because they are worried they're losing their young supporters and they're not prepared to give up without a fight. That's what we're dealing with now, and that's all good news. Well, Phyllis Menes, I thank you for all the work you do and for joining us here today. I look forward to many more conversations with you, obviously, and uh, have a wonderful evening, and thanks so much. Thank you, Mark. And I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Thank you for watching. Take care. I'm realizing the more I think about it, the more I should have given out a disclaimer for the dialectical topic of the settler mentality, otherwise known as whiteness, which is rooted in the Western Church. And you can find its basic origins back to the Inquisition when the notion of race was first devised. And yes, it, it doesn't have to always be Western Christianity. It can be atheism, or it could be agnosticism. Not atheist and not agnostic, and not saying that in order to be a good atheist or a good agnostic, you have to stick with the religion you come from or whatever. And there are some religions, by the way, that can't have agnostics or atheists in it, such as Islam or Hinduism. And if you want to understand that, you're going to have to read what Frederick Danson said, because he talked about philosophical religions, and he talked about... Um, he talked a lot about how religiosity works. So in Judaism, although it is sourced originally in the belief in a particular one divinity... Uh, Torah, Torah gets deeper into concepts of what you do, and that becomes much more of the crux is what the what the mitzvot or mitzvot commandments really are. And so, in that sense, it 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 it, it it's not so much about what what God what God or deity or whatever what what it, for the functionality of that is, but what the divinity expects of you. And um, with Christianity, the, the the symbol of Jesus' sacrifice, which is completely apathetical to Judaism, by the way. Um, but, however, in respect to that position, 
that can be seen in the martyrdom of a lot of people. So liberation theology, you know, black liberation theology, um, things like that. Th th there are, like Frederick Danson, for instance, was an atheist and a Christian. And he pointed out the characteristics of Chris Hedges, the agnostic Christian, that he often was a fan of. Uh, he, before I had met Dr. Opper Weisfeld, I had heard of him through two other people. One was Frederick Danson, and one was my uncle. I had heard about him quite a bit. Frederick Danson never stopped talking about him and how important uh, Dr. Arben Weisfeld was. Uh, she's written about this recently on the blog. But when me and Donna first met, one of the things that, one of the glues that kept us together was an interest in the work of Dr. Robert Weisfeld. Dr. Robert Weisfeld has the ability to bring people together. People, he've, people he's never even met are speaking of him. And a lot of it's happening right here in Arizona. I mean, for real, Dr. Robert Weisfeld has Byzantine Catholic friends that he has never met. F well, fans that would like to say that they're a friend, they're his friend. It's, it's kind of adorable, you know. Um, there's a, there's a certain celebrityness, and these people would like to say, "Well, I know Dr. Abram Weisfeld." Well, no, I know these people here who know Dr. Abram Weisfeld. It's he has. There's a certain air of celebrity. Uh, I have a friend who keeps referring to him as the great Canadian superhero. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that Dr. Abram Weisfeld has shown is the origins of where whiteness came from, which is Western Christianity. And a lot of that is still in Western Christianity, particularly the Protestant and Mormon systems. You could see it in the Ku Klux Klan. You could see it with the rise of Adolf Hitler. But one of the things that should be noted about Adolf Hitler is Adolf Hitler, it's not completely determined whether he himself was really a Christian. He definitely did use Christianity as a vehicle because it works perfectly in white supremacy. Um, he particularly uh, utilized um, certain fractions of the Roman Catholic Church, such as the t uh, such as the, uh, the Teutonic, you know, the Teutonic Knight system, and the Tula Society, which is a fraction of the Catholic Church that is extremely messed up, and they believe in Templars and all these terrible things that should not be. Yeah, we we don't we don't we don't believe in the in any apologies for the Templar Society. Well, despite the fact, but, but, but anyway, that's, remember, a, a, an atheist doesn't have to be given over to atheism, and an agnostic doesn't have to be given over to agnosticism. In fact, there are several, I would say there are several ill-religious atheists and ill-religious agnostics who completely reject atheism or agnosticism because atheism and, atheism and agnosticism are part of this whiteness whiteness doesn't exist and so i should have given all this entire disclaimer first but i'm giving it out now and one of the things that's in the rest of this writing is that it gets in to the decept to, to the illusion the hallucination that is whiteness that it's false consciousness so I'll, I'll get into it now. Despite the fact that their positions are diametrically opposed, modern fascism also creates a synthesis of a white race with culture and identity that are equally non-existent. And yeah, that means it doesn't exist. It's in their heads. It's an indoctrination, and that's how it's maintained. In order to justify a claim of national identity, which there is no such thing. For instance, there is no Jewish question, but we're dealing with the white question. Dr. Weisfeld is dealing with the white question. Uh, Frederick Danson touched upon the white question. There, there's no Jewish question. There's a white question. And I think that that's the thing. There's a solid history of a Jewish nation. There is no white nation. There's the Europeans. The white nation is based on Eurocentricity, and it furthermore doesn't even really exist. There is no white nation. It just doesn't exist. 
it's rooted completely in Western Christianity. It it spewed out unnecessary births of agnosticism and atheism, which genuine agnostics and atheists, even if they think that they follow it, they don't. Because how do you follow not believing in God? Or how do you follow saying out of the question? Okay, and furthermore, how is it... Now, Now, if you say is a person is an nihilist, a nihilist, or an atheist, I go with Frederick Danson. A nihilist is a type of atheist, actually. Not to be confused with that agnosticism. Nihilists are people who are indifferent to those who claim any sense of morality, actually. Frederick Danson got deep into the history of these things. And there's other tendencies of atheism, such as antitheism. So if you're an antitheist, yeah, you're into atheism, because antitheism is a type of atheism. But being an atheist doesn't make you into atheism, and being an agnostic doesn't give, make you into ag agnosticism. In fact, less and less agnostics, barely any anymore, follow agnosticism. Because how do you follow out of the question? How do you follow, it's possible, but there can never be proof? This is the problem of whiteness, is it's delusional thinking. It is at the root of racism, not because Europeans are that way. It's not that Europeans are intrinsically racist. That, that would be a racist statement to make. It's that this was, the, this was this is colonialism. This is pre-capitalism. This is the horror of the West. The horror of the West, not because the West is even intrinsically evil. Again, it's the horror of the West. It is the result of the illiteracy. It is, it is, it is the spewing venom of the Inquisition. By the way, one of the things that Frederick Danson touched upon is that what, don't be angry at the pagans when they speak of the burning times. The burning times are not a myth. They happened. A Christian who stood behind his religion and defended his religion but explained the truth and, and you know what causes these things, I think that that's essential. Because there's no way that, the, that, that Catholicism, even Roman Catholicism, is intrinsically evil, but we do know what happened. We know about the Inquisition, we know about the Crusades, and we know largely what allowed it to happen. We know about how this function of illiteracy goes. So when people say to you education is a privilege and not a right, don't believe it. By the way, the Western Church slaughtered the Eastern Church during the Crusades. They didn't just go after Muslims and Jewish people, they went after the Eastern Christians. Because the Occidental power must rule. And that's what, that's what whiteness really is. It's Occidental supremacy, you could say. And then when you say white supremacy, it's Occidental imperialism, locally or ab abroad. Now, I don't mean to get off track. It's just that it's important to understand the context of what's written here. This context was written not just to explain the nonsense of Breton Tarrant and the evil of Breton Tarrant, but to give a dialectical approach to it and the mentality of it. Because when, for those of us who actually saw The Great Replacement, it was completely insane. Then you have these people like Eric Stryker, who are saying, oh, this guy doesn't represent us. And then Eric Stryker talks to David Duke about it. And he talks about, you know, this guy was okay with Israel, so obviously he's false. Even though David Duke is in support of Israel. And we just showed you how that's possible, how that is definitely unquestionable in part two of this trilogy. Don't forget that. It is the nature of white supremacy to utilize their neo-colonial neo their neo-colonial puppets, the Zionists. And yeah, the Zionists would be the neo-colonial puppets, by the way. Definitely. Of course, Kohanism takes it to a new level, and that's what we are trying to approach here as well. Despite the fact that they're positions are diametrically opposed, modern fascism also creates a synthesis of a white race with culture and identity that are equally non-existent in order to justify a claim of national identity. And through irrational means, they make the claim that since their culture is based on a land they colonized, they some how have a right to it, even when it isn't theirs. They believe that they have a right to the land. 
because the only culture whiteness has is colonial. And they believe colonialism is a valid identity. This belief identifies other colonists as being in the same camp. Whether they are Israeli, Brazilian, colonialists, European nationals, etc. And it seeks to join these conflicting ideologies into a single continuity. As colonialism in all of its forms is rightly under significant threat. Under significant threat. The significant threat is done through the rise of education and the outcry of the oppressed, you know, and you know, the exploited, the proletariat. And by the way, the proletariat does not necessarily always mean the worker. That's classical Marxist nonsense. And that's why that's why I've tried to get us away from classical Marxism as much as mutualism, because classical Marxists I think that it's kind of reprehensible when a Marxist does not acknowledge Lenin or Luxembourg. That's a little bit re reprehensible. But then again, I also find it reprehensible when, um, and, and mind you, I really do connect to Marxist-Leninists a lot. I have for a while now. Um, I find it reprehensible when they don't want to talk about Otto Bauer. You can criticize it all across, you know. But... They believe they have a right to the land because the only culture whiteness has is colonial. And they believe colonization is a valid identity. This belief identifies other colonists as being in the same camp, whether they are Israeli, Brazilian colonists, European nationals, etc. And by the way, being a European national doesn't necessarily have to be colonial, but you do have to shake off the colonial concept of whiteness. So, European nationalities are perfectly fine. Pan-Europeanism is perfectly legitimate. It's the appropriation by the alt-right to take that away f that undermines it. Because, to keep in mind, because of the po way the population works, in order for true pan-Europeanism to even work, it has to be in cooperation with pan-Africanism and pan-Asianism. That's an essential. And also, yes, there should be a back to Europe movement, but that couldn't be a universal thing. There should be because a lot of people of European descent want to go back to Europe. I am one of them. But from the Jewish standpoint, the first step must be national cultural autonomy. Doikite, for wherever we are, that is our homeland. Doikite, by the way, is Yiddish for hereness. And it seeks to join these conflicting ideologies into a single continuity as colonialism in all its forms is rightly under sufficient threat. Significant threat. As you can see, in order to save white supremacy, they must divorce themselves from reality in order to answer what they perceive as materialistic questions. The white question. Yep, the white question. There is no Jewish question. There's a white question. And we've been talking about this white question. Dr. Weisfeld has been bringing it forth. Frederick Tanson was the first person I ever met that to bring it up. He described it as Eurocentricity. And I would say that it is Eurocentricity. And I say that Dr. Weisfeld was accurate when he identified its birthplace. And not just its birthplace, but its hospital, its, its, its regeneration chamber. Because when the atheism and the agnosticism fails, they do need to revert back to a type of Western Christian claims. That becomes essential. Because who's going to be willing to die for whiteness under the pretense of atheism or agnosticism? Nobody. So this shows that Dr. Weisfeld's contribution to the white question is essential. One thing that we have already concluded, and we've already concluded it because we can see it, it's just getting the it's it's getting these it's getting these ignorant people to see that their whiteness is a lie. It doesn't exist. Whiteness is a lie, as Frederick Danson put it. Shake off the white lie. They try to dodge these materialistic questions, the white question, if you will, 
even though the basis of such questions were only poisted as nonsense by the white bourgeoisie in the first place. That means that the power structure is fully aware that there is no such thing as whiteness. Whiteness is a convenient tool to mobilize the masses so that class consciousness doesn't arise. And it's also an inhibitor to the genuine um, national impulses, the real national impulses. An inhibitor. For whiteness is, in fact, false consciousness. I can't remember who they are, but there are some theorists that talked about false consciousness. Well, if we're gonna make, if we're gonna do things that we do, like take good theory, theoretical works and put them in an even better context, one of them we should put is that what part of the problem with whiteness is that it's false consciousness. Even though white supremacy, wait, sorry, yeah, first. These were rhetorical talking points designated to protect bourgeois interests. Even though the basis of such questions were already posed as nonsense, as nonsense by the white bourgeoisie in the first place to galvanize white settlers, these were rhetorical talking points designated to protect bourgeois interests when espoused to the white population, even though white supremacy can never be inherently sustainable, the contradiction is resolved in the eyes long enough to organize white reactionaries behind an ideological ideology. That is, an ideology that is extremely ideological to the point where it can make it enough sense to the stupidity that have those appeals to whiteness which cannot exist. One that seems to respond to outside pressures, but does so from a perspective that is inherently hostile to the human majority, and will thus inevitably be disposed. How will it be sustainable when you make three quarters of the world's population your enemy? Hence, the innate contradictions. And the only solution for them is to react with violence and justify their position through ignorance. An attempt to persuade their own people that white supremacy is viable, even though the contradictions don't go away. Since they will ever since since they will never go away, the ideology spirals further and further into ignorance and violence to justify it. Hence the new formations of fascism sprouting around the globe, which increases the illogical nature of white supremacy tenfold. In order for the white bourgeoisie to retain their power, mind you, the white bourgeoisie refers to the Eurocentric power structure, which is, by the way, the aristocratical system of the power structure. And a lot of it is still German, by the way. You see this with the Bayer and uh, the, the, you know, like during World War II, there was Operation Paperclip, you know, the, the National Socialists uh, went in, you know, the Nazis uh, went in, the, the, these SS men went in with the OSS to form the, C, the CIA. So the Central Intelligence Agency, as we understand it, does have its roots in Nazism. All in the name of stopping the Soviet Union. Just like Gulag exaggeration and to exaggerate what Stalin did wrong and to water down whatever he got right and whatever he did correctly is a veiled attempt to further Holocaust revisionism which will inevitably lead to straight-out Holocaust denial. Now, I don't know if I've said this ever, but I mean, not publicly like this, but I need to say it. Joseph Stalin is one of my heroes, but my biggest problem with Joseph Stalin was the way that he cracked down on the United Front, which was completely 100% unjustifiable. Now, I could believe that there was that wasn't done out of malice, and that there was some logic behind what they were doing, but that shows the problems. That would show the problems with the positions that they hold, that they held, you know. I would, again, 
I would say that these conversations become necessary because I think that the Marxist Leninists, the Marxist Leninists, Maoists, the Maoists, third worldists will continue to want our collaboration because there's a lot more common ground that's been unrecognized. But it does mean that Uri Adia is correct when he wants to answer the national question. And we've answered it. And we have to answer it because if we don't, people are going to continue to go along with nationalism. And when they don't go along with nationalism, they'll go along with Stalin's earlier works, which was interesting and did solve things. But the problem is, is it only solved it from the point of view of Marxists. And it didn't completely solve it. It solved it for the it solved it for the nations based on uh, ethnicity and culture, but it did not solve it for those that are based on religion and culture. And the downplaying of how how religiosity is a matter of orientation uh, has been an intrinsic problem in all Marxists, and the problem lies with Karl Marx himself again. Remember, Karl Marx wrote something called the National Question. Several of us, we've been trying to keep this in people's mind freshly, and you have to. How will it be sustainable when you make three quarters of the world's population your enemy? Hence, it's inherent contradictions, and the only solution for them is to react with violence and to justify their position through ignorance. They attempt to persuade their own people that white supremacy is viable, even though the contradictions don't go away. Since they will never go away, the ideology spirals further and further into ignorance and violence to justify itself. You can see some of this in the indifference from Donald Trump on these recent acts of violence that have occurred. Hence the new formations of fascism sprouting around the globe, which increases the illogical nature of white supremacy tenfold in order for the white bourgeoisie to retain power. This is the type of ideology it spreads to their subjects. And being that it is so irrational, in no doubt presents itself as having been pushed into a corner. It is a sign of success of decolonization and the people's revolutionary will, but before colonization and white supremacy resigns, it will attempt to start a war. I think another thing that should be pointed out here, colorblindness is a form of racism. It breeds assimilation, and it typically targets black dialectics, black Marxist-Leninist dialectics which Black Panthers had, which were far superior and still remain far superior than to any Marxist tendency whatsoever. And I don't like to say superior like that, but I mean, if we're going to talk about being correct and what's good for all of us, the problem here we have is that there needs to be the engaging of Risa Posse. And there needs to be a concept of what is dialectical materialism. Dialectical materialism by Karl Marx is what I would say essential. A lot of people point to the national question. Well, if the national question was so great... If that was really Stalin's best work, why does Uri Adia feel so compelled to write commentary on it? Because it's flawed. There are some breakthroughs in it, but the breakthroughs, let's be honest, are for, from a Marxian standpoint. It's good. For, it was good for the Marxists to make better identification. Had Stalin not written that, I fear Marxists would have gone so insane in certain ways, and I think that there would have never been a Black Panther Party. But... I would say that not only should you read Dialectical Materialism by Joseph Stalin, you need to read Dialectical Materialism by Joseph Stalin, but you, um, if, by the way, I, I'm, I'm trying to fit the schedule here, so if I said Dialectical Materialism by Karl Marx, that was a mistake. Dialectical Materialism by Joseph Stalin, very important work, but coupled with that should be it's a shorter one. In fact, I would say for an introductory reasons, because it does work, is the ABCs of Materialist Dialectics by Leon Trotsky. And yes, I'm saying we should read some Leon Trotsky. Trotsky was not always wrong. In fact, Trotsky sometimes had the higher picture. And that's kind of the issue at hand, is that the dogmatism, like, well, I like Trotsky, but not Stalin. 
this is part of the disease of what I call communism as a disease. Now, I that 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 might be a little chauvinistic on my part, but I would I, I'd say, I'm going to admit that I, I confess that that's a little emotional. I get frustrated with communists saying, "Well, you're not being a good socialist if you're not a communist." I disagree. I disagree completely, and that's one of the reasons why I fully endorse Donna Newman's use of Rudolf Rocker. I think that this compound synthesis is necessary because unless these things are brought up again, people will continue to only follow Marxism, Leninism, or hopefully if that's the case, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. And people are like, why? Why would you be against that since you have strong leads it? Because they still get a lot of things wrong. They do. They get a lot of things wrong. Their definition of the state is not even correct. It's more correct, but it's still not correct. It's still incorrect. And they lack the, the, the critique that is also better in the anarchists, but the anarchists fail miserably at identifying the state. So, with all these problems in mind, I, I say that if we're going to take dialectics seriously, we're going to end up concluding that communism is not what happens after world socialist victory. The main reason, though, that white supremacy is unstable is because it is predicated on capitalism, which itself is ecologically and socially non-viable. Their false mythos of race has created their false mythos of race was created by the bourgeoisie. I would insert in there from the Inquisition that became part of the bourgeoisie and sold to them so that the white population would not only be permissible of would not only be permissive of their own exploitation and theft of their wages but collaborate with the ruling class under the false notion that all white people have inherent superiority even though this was a smokescreen to pre even though this was a smokescreen to present to them the wealth of riches as a shared supremacy among all whites. And remember, whites are nothing but delusional Europeans who basically should self-emancipate by shaking off the white lie. True European liberation has to come through shaking off the white lie, but also getting into the white question, what is it? What is it? Since we know it doesn't exist in the first place. you know, And yet people will hold this abstract concept. Well, the answers have been through the great theorists, Frederick Danson, Abraham Weisfeld, Herbert Dillon, they've all identified this correctly. Dr. Weisfeld has given the correct notion of where its origins come from and how it, can, how it regenerates whenever it falls. The Western Church. Frederick Danson has explained its nature, Eurocentricity. I could talk about Herbert Dillon, but Herbert Dillon pretty much just espouses what Frederick Danson says about it, but in further detail. And if we want to combat it, we have to listen to the Demarchists like Herbert Dillon and Frederick Danson and Marcus Din Jamal and Shabazz Din Jamal and Dr. Abram Weisfeld. And we should read Settlers. I'm just starting to read Settlers, and the person who wrote this is very fond of the book Settlers, and he it, it, it's woke up a lot of people as to the mentality. Is Settlers perfect, though? Um, a lot of people would say no. A lot of people in Black Nations say that it's essential uh, to read, but that it's not enough, and that if you go by it alone, it's it, it, it could fall you into dogmatism, which is also what Steve Struggle said. This idea is only possible within the current capitalist context, though. Since class and racial oppression must be kept in place to secure white supremacy by default, the only way to do that would be to impoverish other people, to deny them resources. A class of people cannot be impoverished without making their resources limited. Resources cannot be limited without making resources non-renewable. To do that to do that would be to continue in the course of harvesting the resources of the earth, which will threaten all people, including whites. That's right, it will include the colonist settlers themselves. 
Their only way forward, then, would be to exterminate all non-white populations, according to the notions of white supremacy. How is it that... How, it, how would that be done if whites are a global minority? Now, as we pause from this, I am also going to point out that Frederick Danson actually pointed out that there was literally no justification for, um, for certain notions. He espoused that religios that there's no religiosity, for instance, in the polytheists. And if you get into the historical journey he takes with you on the books that he wrote, this is correct. Um, polytheists were not religious. Religious, religious requires um, a type of uh, religiosity, which is a matter of orientation. That there's no such thing as a polytheist religion, there's no such thing as an atheist religion or agnostic religion. In fact, he pointed out that even polytheist, polytheist, polytheists do not have to have polytheism. Polytheists. He he brought up a um, he brought up a, a example of a friend of his. This is in his book, but he brought up a friend. He brought up a friend of his. Um, I think it's in his book. He wrote two big books, by the way. Well, I mean, they're not really big books. Well, they're they're larger than the life books, I should say. But they're very good books. Um, some of the chapters have already been published in his thesis. His thesis is called National Cultural Autonomy. And he mentions uh, uh, with quite a large affection to what he refers to as one of the great intellectuals, Dr. Abram Weisfeld. But one of the things that Frederick Danson pointed out was that he had a friend who was a polytheist who truly believed in the gods, the many gods, that the many gods that they were divine. And he hated the many gods so much that he converted to Judaism just to piss them off, just because he hated them so much. And because, and, and uh, according to Frederick Danson, this man was truly Jewish. He didn't go around espousing the worship of the many gods because he hated them. And because polytheism is poly, you know, many gods or many, or, 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 many, or, or multiple divinity, because you could also say that there are the concept of gods that are not divine. So uh, that gets into another thing, and, and I don't want to get into the, those deeper rooted. That's that's deeper, uh, and we don't. We're not going to have time for that. But what I think is interesting about this is that what 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 Fred um, talks about is that he didn't go around talking about the, this multiple d d divinity because he hated it, and he became not just devoutly Jewish in so many ways, but his consciousness became Jewish. What Frederick Danson refers to as Jewishness being, you know, largely being having a lot to do with social justice and intellectual inquiry, this man, you know, embodied every facet naturally, before and after conversion. And that's why in Judaism we say uh, ger, uh, ger, ger get, which means a convert who converts. But another thing to point out is that Judaism wouldn't allow a polytheist or an atheist or agnostic to convert. And we sort of stand by that. But if it happens, if you want a theological excuse for it, or not excuse, reasoning for it, or not a theological one, I don't deal in theology, if you want a mystical reason, it's because the, the person really does have a Jewish neshama, regardless of what they believe. That that the, and 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 that's me connecting religiosity to my own uh, esoteric system of mysticism. But the point I'm saying is that it works so much in scientific and in mystical theory. If you get into material theory and the theory of development of mankind and the high levels of cultures that have risen and fallen, how important culture is, which is one of the problems with communism that it does hurt culture as does nationalism, then there's some serious solid truth to this. The ideas of Frederick Danson are shared by Auburn Weisfeld, are shared by Herbert Dillon and the Jin Jamal brothers and Miriam Emmesberg. And now it looks like even pretty much all of us, this current wave of consciousness that is rising, It's, 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 there's so much that can be said. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I've consistently supported the concept of the United Front, and I do condemn Stalin's decision to slam down the United Front. People will be like, well, because Trotsky endorsed it, or because they were anarchists, therefore, uh, well, and because they aligned with Social Democrats. And no, I don't believe that it's great to align with Social Democrats, but we are talking about Nazi Germany here. 
And we are in a... I would say that we're in a similar situation today, but I would also say that the rise of fascism happened way before Trump. It's been happening. It's just Trump is the peeling off of the mask. But that doesn't water down the sickness of Trump. I mean, the actions he's done is already scary enough, and we could be completely destroyed in 2020 if something doesn't shift in the correct direction. But anyway. The idea of supremacy is only possible within, within the current capitalist context, though. Since class and racial precedent must be kept in place to secure white, white supremacy by default, the only way to do that would be to impoverish other people or deny them resources. A class of people cannot be a class of people cannot be impoverished without making their resources limited. Resources is, cannot resources cannot be limited without making resources non-renewable. And to do that, you would continue to, in the course of harvesting the resources of the earth with all sorry with with which will threaten all people including the self-proclaimed whites their only way forward then would be to exterminate non-white populations according to the notions of white supremacy how is that to be done if whites are a global minority now one of the things that's interesting about this is that when you go around, n not black people, but certain black reactionaries who are not educated and who haven't studied, you know, their own forefathers, such as the Black Panther Party and, you know, the Malcolm X and stuff, and haven't gotten into it, because when black people study, they're practically invincible. That's what, that's what history has shown. Which is also why white people fear them. Who are the white people? The white people are not any people. The white people are people that subscribe to that ideology, whereas the black people are the descendants of the slaves. By the way, the typical national liberation colors of black nationality, which is a real thing to the concept of blackness, is black, green, and red. And you should, if you want to understand it, during the Panther uh, uh, period, when the Panthers were on their height from the 60s and 70s, Gil Scott Heron, uh, he wrote a song called Black, uh, Red, and Green. I think that that's what it's called. Going along with Steve Struggle and talking about understanding the, the, the culture studying the culture and the music. The very idea that white people can exert control over the world permanently without the current capitalist power structure belies the fact that they are a world minority. And true to form, colonialism will go the way of the dinosaur, but not without a last dying attempt to rescue itself. This is attempted by imbuing the concept of white nationalism and white supremacy by proxy among the worldwide colonial population to try to resist their inevitable collapse as seen as to how their concept of whiteness is false, their aspirations to have their own society without the current bourgeois control will inherently falter. It is in its self-proclaimed supremacy, in its self-proclaimed superiority. But as much, but as much is irrelevant, so long as such an inspired theory can ideologically motivate their population to racist violence, which will unwittingly protect the ruling class from their own overthrow, as was their plan, by spreading these ideas in the first place. Now, this is evident when you look at the way of how Donald Trump had extreme corporate funding. Not just from himself, but extreme corporate funding. So, funding. And, and that, I mean, yeah, think about that for a second. It's their plan. And it's working. It's working right now. European Americans are committing violence on black Americans and African Americans on a daily basis because they think they white when there's no such thing. They are espousing anti-Semitic 
hate, both Islamophobic and Judophobic. They are espousing anti-Semitic racism, trying to say, well, these Jewish people are a race when we're not. They're so ignorant, many of them, with no historical background. I've been told to go back to Israel when I have no cultural or historical connections to the state of Israel. I think, if I recall, Dr. Weisfeld um, he expressed uh, um, he expressed once violence uh, against him about a similar um, matter. I think, I think, I think that he did, or I might be confusing the situation. But he's told me some horrific stories about what's happened to him. Not a lot, because I don't typically ask that much, but sometimes I do. I'll be surprised if right now he isn't having tremendous nightmares. I am definitely having tremendous nightmares as of late. You too? That's what I thought. I was about to ask, it's just mean to ask. Well, okay, but it's not, it's not mean to ask. It's just, never mind, never mind. We're, we're <laughs> One of these days we're going to both be on camera. I, I'm shy, or shy too, but Dr. Weisfeld, everybody sees his face. Yeah. The new synthesis of popular white supremacy ha hates this aforementioned old order, but unwill unwittingly preserves it because their approach is undialectical to its very core. Therein lies the weakness to whiteness. Because it doesn't exist, it has no dialectics. But that's also been the weakness of all these Marxist tendencies, is that the unwillingness to scrap Hegel means that you can't upgrade dialectics. That is why, and uh, yeah, like like as in your theories. Let's see, Donna Newman has this theory, basically, that what has allowed the dialectics to be hijacked is the fact that it's tainted by he Hegel. And therefore, the establishment uses dialectics on us. The, 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 the high class, the high uh, bourgeois class through the, through the intelligence agencies, who couldn't possibly believe in whiteness because they would know it's wrong, as this shows. But you don't have to make whiteness. People just have to be brought up in that indoctrination. And, you know, um, they, they don't even have to be brought up by, by school. They teach it to themselves. They teach these lies to themselves. And when everybody snatches away their fantasy, they try really hard to preserve it through the violence. That's what this is all about. That's what was... That is Brenton Tarrant. That's who Brenton Tarrant is. Brenton Tarrant isn't working for some covert agency. And he probably did know people from the Templar Society. Yeah. Probably. But Breton Tarrant is what Breton Tarrant is. Breton Tarrant is exactly what's described. That's what this is all about. And it's, it became important to me because when I read The Great Replacements, I was so enraged that these white supremacists were saying that this guy is not connected and what it is. Well, we have the answer for it. We have it in this, these papers. That's what this has been about this whole time. Because it's probably only going to get worse. Violence is as American as cherry pie. And we are in a lot of trouble, and we do need this united front, and that's another reason why I had requested this writings, is because I am creating an argument in the spirit of what Dr. Weisfeld had asked about, about a united front, and me and Donna Newman have been putting stuff together to do this, and we've been getting assistance from people. That's what this has been about. But it's really good that we have been, that the three of us have collaborated as to what the situation is about candidates. And that is, you're going to find that on the website now. It will be way more flushed out than what I said, too. And the rhetoric will be better than what I said as well. Their ideology is inappropriable and doomed, considering its contradictions. They attempt to maintain the false notion of white supremacy. White simulationists, they attempt to answer 
perceived social problems with unrealistic solutions and unfounded logic. All the white desiring to overthrow the very force that sustains whiteness. This creates a tailspin by which they must adapt their reactionary beliefs into the new synthesis we see, which is causing an upsurge in violence and austerity. And in the circumstance where their ideology leads them to believe that there is some social problem where there truly isn't, this will further lead them down the path of reactionary thinking. Thinking that will be wholly ineffective for answering the actual current problems that face quote-unquote white proletariat, such as their opiate addictions, incest, poverty, thuggish white-on-white -white crime, etc., etc. Nor will this ideology be able to functionally address the creation of their, theor theor their theoretical ethnostate. If unscientific notions predominates a group ideology, it will be impossible to ever aim that society or organize towards a sustainable goal. That is why the new synthesis of white supremacy is chaotic, illogical, angry, unrealistic, and unprepared to deal with reality in either praxis or theory. This necessarily leads them to undertake terrorism as their main goal. But white supremacist has been incalculated long enough to accept this unrealistic mythos that they have unwittingly adopted from the bourgeoisie. And since they must accept the state-sanctioned falsehood of whiteness, they must also appropriate on equally illogical basis on an on an equally illogical basis in response to every mater to every material factor they face. This creates a blindness that is given to violence against the entirety of colonized people, and even to other whites. It becomes presumption of its own infallibility to I mean well I'm, I'm having a problem okay all right yeah I see that it becomes presumption to, of its own infallibility to the point of where any social condition real or imagined must be answered from a point of white supremacist violence in one fashion or another that is why whiteness in its Arid social theory was inevitably going to develop further away from classical fascism and into its current frenetic manifestation and into total self-destruction and onward chaos. Oh, thank you very much. What is this? Oh, that's different. Thank you. I have another pack in the drawer, by the way. Yeah. By the way, when we find whoever did this, there will be hell to pay. Donna Newman has half of her face, like, beat up.
the condition that is on this paper is, hits us in a very real, real way. Classical fascism and imperialism understood reality to an extent, but was simply hostile to life for material gain, and had yet not been challenged on their unscientific notions. Modern fascism is inherently endorsed by the bourgeois class to conform to whites, by creating a narcissistic fiction, while simultaneously neutralizing the threat that the white population could pose to their rule if they were to attain class consciousness themselves. But the white population is no less capable for this, given that it takes proactive, conscious, personal conditioning to dehumanize oppressed and colonized people. They do this in order to fulfill their fantasy on the one end, and on the other, endorse the concept of whiteness regardless of whether they truly believe its logical premise. Simply to protect their status in society, there is no room for forgiveness, only condemnation, as both are conscious decisions. Their inability, their their in, in their in their lack of ability to realistically identify their own internal social problems of their society and address them as with realistic solutions by overthrowing their masters and working in conjunction with the colonized and oppressed masses prevents them from ever becoming anything else than a completely disagreeable force for terrorism, especially considering that their ideology lends itself to social individualism and hence creates a personality narcissistic outlook. So even if they were able to achieve a theoretical ethnostate, it would falter, as was in the case of the Nazi party. That any civilization premence on unrealistic worldview given to individualism will become a parasite to itself and eat itself alive via opportunism. Each member of such civilization is imparted with the notion that they are inherently superior. That's how whiteness works, by the way. It is not meant to be realistic. It is not meant to be true. It is a colonial hallucination. And again, you know, I would I would trace this back to the Inquisition because when you get into how Dr. Weisfeld describes the Western Christian supremacy, this is what we're talking about when with whiteness. And yes, that includes part of that is atheism, agnosticism, but not the atheist, not the agnostic. And neo um, polytheism often does this too. And yeah, uh, that's not an anti-pagan statement. And we're not against all polytheists. But people forget what, you know, the revision, another part of historical revisionism that Frederick Danson put out is the way people will look back at the, polytheist, uh, the polytheistic uh, systems that exist and they'll try to justify it, but their aims are anti-Semitic. This is something else Frederick Danson wrote about. Frederick Danson, um, died the same year my father died in 2010 and it was very difficult to watch it he had lesions on his face he died of the aids virus and he refused to seek med med medical treatment because he wanted to stay off the grid his best friend herbert dillon uh his frederick uh, herbert dillon's wife was in fact the guy that treated frederick danson i mean it did keep him alive for a while and he did finish his two books and then he died He was a genius. He introduced me to... His introduction to me on the matter of Dr. Abram Weisfeld was Dr. Abram Weisfeld's book The End of Zionism and the Liberation of the Jewish People. That's how he first introduced me to... Uh, to um, 
it. Now, the sad thing was, is I loved that book, and he wouldn't let me keep that book. And then one day, my uncle, who was fully aware of Dr. Weisfeld, bought me a copy. You can find that on the website, by the way. Yes, it, it links to Dr. Weisfeld's books. We need to put the Federation book on there, too. Actually, yeah. When white, when white supremacy isn't enough to, to, to sate them in such a society, it will devolve further into class supremacy, intellectual supremacy, the hoarding of resources will begin, and the utilization for state... The utilization of the state for personal means will bifurcate and rob that society of its own resources and eventually tear itself down. The same is occurring in our current white supremacist society. The white supremacists are told... that the aforementioned is not the reason for our social ills and instead are given nebulous explanations that immigrants are taking their, their jobs or that Jews run the world. I've been a victim of that, by the way. I've actually had people ask me for loans when I walk down the street. That's why, instead of wearing a yarmulke, I wear the current hat that I wear. I used to wear a yarmulke proudly, and I love my yarmulke, but I, I mean, my, my kippa, you know? And I had a real kippa. I have a real kippa, I just, I mean, I, I might have misplaced it. But, um, I think it's, well, I mean, anyway. When I tell them that I can't give you a loan, I don't have that money, I'd be, I, I, I've been threatened by violence. Because it's impossible that Jews don't run the world, according to a lot of people. And the new synthesis of white supremacy is nothing more than a reactionary ideology implanted by the bourgeoisie, created to try to, to, to created to try and prevent, colonize, and oppress people from taking over. Given the white nation's instability and the lack of knowledge, it is inevitable. And by the way, I think I'm pretty convinced that that's why the Bund has had such repression. That is also why counterintelligence had to break down the Black Panther Party. That is why the Libria Consolidation Party, by the way, uh, these colorblind people, because that's all I hear, by the way, when I hear communism, typically, is I hear blind, I, I hear colorblind, which is assimilationist racism as opposed to race hatred racism. And no, the Libria Consolidation Party is not part of the CIA. They work in collaboration, as do some other groups that we're not mentioning here. But we know who those groups are. We've been under the attack of the worst version of communists that we could think of, the Libria Consolidation Party, which we are... We're, I'm, I'm pretty sure other Trotskyists will denounce them, because there's no way the Libria Consolidation Party, of all Trotskyists, there's no way that those Trotskyists represent other Trotskyists. That'd be like saying the Hoshists represent the Marxist-Leninists. Most Marxist-Leninists are actually very aggravated when they come across the Hoshists. Just like most Maoists can't stand the Austin Maoists. No one trusts the Austin Maoists, and no one should. And the, new, and the new synthesis of white supremacy is nothing more than a reactionary ideology implanted by the bourgeoisie, created to try and prevent, colonize, and oppress people from taking over. Given the white nation's instability and lack of knowledge, this is inevitable. The state is attempting to galvanize whites to seamlessly protect their own interests, but are unaware that white supremacy itself has created such conditions. To them, their ideology fits the mythos of whiteness that must retain intact, that must remain intact, regardless of the fact that it doesn't exist, by the way. Jewishness exists, blackness exists, whiteness does not.
That's actually a rhyme, by the way, that was invented by Isaiah P. Comenstein. <laughs> Jewishness exists, blackness exists, whiteness does not. By the way, if you want to know what type of jazz Gilad Otzman plays, it's called white jazz. And there are several black people who have said so out here. Just so you know. Oh, it, to make it even funnier, before I ever heard them say it, and perhaps our black, our, perhaps our our uh, our black comrades want to hear this, because I know some of our viewership is uh, is from Panther Code. Doctor Robert Weisfall said that before I heard any of you say it. Just so you know. To them, their ideology fits the mythos of whiteness that must remain intact if they are to establish power. And being that they are neither correct, and being that they, and being that they have neither correct theory nor praxis to facilitate revolution, they can only become terrorists. Their aims idealistic and immaterial. Their concepts unfounded, and. And they, and their entire purpose is being racialized, and their entire purpose is being radicalized, it, and their entire purpose being radicalized is to be disposed is to be a disposable number in the army of the ruling class that is indifferent to them. This is their white pride, a false, hollow shell that they traded for their own humanity. I'll repeat that again so that we can define this delusion known as whiteness, which is a delusion. And we are seeing the only conceivable progression of white supremacy when threatened. I'll go back actually further, because I, I might have just lost my place. But anyway, this is their white pride, a false, hollow shell that they traded for their own humanity. And we are seeing the only conceivable progression of white supremacy when threatened. The same progression as when a lie is uncovered. Denial, defense, anger, elaboration, and then the law and 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 then the lie is defeated they have no power beyond what they receive from their masters the group who ultimately benefits from their ideology in terms of two in terms of who retains power it is the bourgeoisie and i believe they feel that let us keep up the pressure At the end of the day, I am in no way excusing white supremacists as if they were merely brainwashed pawns. The initial ideology of whiteness was created by the ruling class, yes. But white settlers to this day make the conscious decision to endorse it and elaborate upon it exclusively in benefit of retaining their privilege and boosting their psychopathic, narcissistic outlook for their own gratification. The new white supremacy was developed in collaboration with the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, and the collaborating class of white settlers. They are fully aware of their amor amoral they are fully aware of their amoral they are fully aware of their amoral actions. The collaborating class just aren't aware that it is fallacious or simply don't care so long as they can recruit others to achieve their aims and retain privilege they proactively call for genocide against marginalized colonized and oppressed people the world over they make the call for other ethno nationalists ones that practice white supremacy brand proxy to join them and they have works from previous colonists on which to further develop their ideas. They ultimately are culpable for their sadistic actions and ideas. 
and in ensuring decade and in the ensuring decades and in the ensuring decades will okay hold on they ultimately are culpable for their sadistic actions and ideas and in the ensuring decades will answer for it at the barrel of a gun Makes you want to makes you want to sing the United Front song, doesn't it? And just because he's human, a man would like a little bit. Which sounds actually much better in German, by the way. So, I'm going to leave you now with uh, Olin of the Machika Movement's lecture. Uh, I do want to make clear that Olin is very sincere, but I don't think that Olin uh, and I don't think a lot of the Machika Movement completely understand Jewishness. So you can't get too upset when they say. Uh, incorrect lines. Just like I want to say to um, all of our black comrades, we are catching up with you on your use of dialectical materialism. I promise you that. And we hope that you continue to adopt notions like national cultural autonomy that work. I know that Black Nation had it from the get-go, but I like the fact that Panther Code is just incorporating it in that, and that they were willing to conceive of something they hadn't before. And, I, and and without Isaiah P. Comiste, we wouldn't have been able to dialectically prove it. Well, and Hannah Toff, because she's a genius. Um, but you have to consider these, these matters. So this lecture from the founder and spokesman of the Machika movement, Olin, uh, this was done in February. Now, I've been aware of the Machika movement because of Frederick Ganson for a while, and um, I've been around certain people in the Machika movement from time to time since meeting Donna Newman. Donna Newman has a lot more close connection to the Machika movement. They are wonderful people, um, but ac according to Donna Newman, they, they 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 could learn more about Jewishness and what that actually means. Um, and then they and 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 we we're confident because they don't shy away people. I would like to say that, but Olin is rightfully angry. But he's he's a really good orator, particularly when he when particularly when he uh, when when he talks about the historological nature of what happened to his people. But this lecture took place on February twelfth, two thousand seventeen. Thank you. 
can't say the same thing, can we? We have a few doctors, a few architects, but that's not what we're known for. But that was what we were known for before 1492, that we were very creative people, that we were people of, of cities, clean cities, of astronomers and writers and great art. Our people don't know of any of this. But they also do not know that the majority of our people were living in magnificent cities uh, that made great contributions to the world with our cuisine, which most of, our, most of the world knows about our cuisine today. That's something that has uh, lasted till today. But most people don't know about our calendar system, which is a calendar more accurate than the one we use today. We also have all these great buildings, uh, the, the largest so-called pyramids in the world, the two largest ones are in what is called Mexico and in Guatemala. And we had a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, architecture that still can be seen in the ruins. And we had our own laws and we had great literature. One of the things that Europeans like to say, white supremacists Europeans like to say is, well you didn't have a uh, uh, borders, you guys didn't have uh, laws, you didn't have uh, anything to keep us uh, from owning the land because you guys didn't believe in owning the land. That's all convenient for them to say. But we did actually believe in owning the land. We owned it collectively. And we did have laws. My Shikha movement is working to make sure that all of our people know of our great civilizations, our ancient cities, and our great accomplishments. We also want our people to know that we were not defeated by a European superior race and not by forces or guns, but by Europeans using smallpox as a weapon of mass extermination of our people. The killings of 95% of our people, killing 100 million of our people throughout our continent was the most savage of the crimes of the Europeans, more savage than destroying our cities and civilizations, more savage than burning our libraries, destroying our schools and universities. The truth is that they killed their people in a cowardly, savage, and inhumane way. All of this accomplishments, all of this uh, history of crimes of Europeans on our people, it's something that's absent from our, our from being human on, on this planet. We don't know any of this, and it's all intentional. We're supposed to be in. Mexican movement teaches that we are Nican Flaca, the indigenous people of this continent, which is the truth of who we are. Nican Flaca includes the full blood and the mixed blood, the light and the dark, the ones of the north from Alaska to the ones of the south in what is called Chile and Argentina. We are all one people, one race, one nation. We teach our people that we are not any of the European imposed false labels of Indians. Indians are the people of India. Red people. Where did they get this red people from? But then again, white Europeans call themselves white. They're not white. They're pinkish, they're pale, everything. But they like to call themselves white because it gives a sense of cleanness, of purity, of positive things, but they are not white. But they also call us Hispanic and Latino, which are just European labels, or raza, mestizo. And now, a new genocidal term, Latinx. That's a new one. They also figure out more and more ways to take away from our identity. These are all identities that are ignorant and racist and genocidal acts that are meant to destroy us as a people. We, Mexican Movement, uh, we teach with our website, social media, with YouTubes, and with our protests. Over the years, we have protested and stopped the movie uh, that was going to be about Zapata starring a Spaniard, Antonio Banderas. We stopped Ron Howard from making a movie that would glorify the conquistadores. We hounded Eddie Olmos for years for promoting gang films and racist stereotypes of our people. We protested other films of Hollywood. We protested Steven Spielberg's Road to El Dorado cartoon and made it lose money. We also did the same thing with the Frida film because they refused to hire Mexicans to play Mexicans. We have been protesting the attacks on our people from white supremacists and from bandidos. In the last two years, we protested the canonization of Junipero Serra for almost a year. We have protested Columbus Day for the last 15 years. The last, and last year, we protested Trump for half a year. 
year. We are only a few people in the Shiva movement, and we have managed to have people know more of our history and to question the false labels of Hispanic and Latino. We have had two films canceled because of our protests. We have had two films lose money because of our protests. We have, in 26 years of the Shiva movement, been doing the work that we do because it has to be done. I personally have been involved in protests since I was 18 years old in 1968. I have lived my life to learn and to teach our true history, our true Nicaragua identity, and to learn of the Holocaust of our people, the genocide of our people of the last 500 years. And here we are today in the beginnings of the Trump regime in what is beginning to look more and more like a dictatorship, a white supremacist dictatorship. <coughs> Today I want to talk about the coming raids, the deportations, the coming terrorism in our communities, and our need to organize the way the Jews of Europe should have organized. They failed to stand up against the Nazis, and they were killed in their Holocaust. We have already been killed in one Holocaust, that killed 95% of our people. Europeans killed 100 million of our people all across our continent. And that means nothing to most of our people today because they never saw a movie on our Holocaust, never read of it in our schools. But we are at the beginning of a new Holocaust of our people and we are not prepared, not organized, not united, not even like educated. For now, we need to focus on survival and not to make the mistakes of the Jews yeah. in thinking that it isn't going to happen to us. It's not that bad. Besides, I was born here. The deportations are just for the undocumented. That's a horrible way to think for our people. They have already <coughs> begun the deportations of our people since the 1930s and then again in the 50s and in the last 60 years. This has been an ongoing process. Prepare for the coming Trump Gestapo. Documented and undocumented need to prepare for the horror of the raids and deportations that are absolutely coming our way. Prepare for our people to betray us, as we saw in the large numbers of our people who voted for Trump. But let's plan a little better than the Jews did. Documented must help undocumented. Be prepared for raids and for racial profiling. Have a plan of escape and hiding in another home. Have a plan for your children in case you are deported. Have at least $200 in cash to help you survive. Those of us born here or are citizens always carry your passport. If you don't have a passport, get one. It only takes two weeks to get one. Stay informed before Trump starts his raids on a large scale. The raids have already begun. When you see or know of a raid, post it on social media. Offer refuge, yeah. hiding to undocumented in your home. When the raids start, don't travel outside of the big cities. This is real. There is a coming horror that will affect all Nican Flaca. The better prepared you are, the better you will survive. If you think this is an exaggeration, remember that the Jews in Germany thought that Hitler was all talk. They were dead wrong. So that's... So there are horrible things coming. There are really horrible things. And for the people who think that we're exaggerating in this, you know what? Let's... I hope I'm wrong. But if I'm not wrong, maybe we will, will not be prepared enough. Alright, um, a lot of people that are new to, to um, the materials that we're presenting, 
step Mexican. And, and the good example of that, uh, how anything Mexican, which is, is equivalent, again, using the, the colonized language, Mexican is equal to Indian. You know, that's why when Trump was saying, he said, all those Mexicans, the code word was all those Indians coming across the board. Like when you say, let's make America great again. I mean, we know what he's really saying, right? Let's make America white again. So people understand what's behind the codes. Um, and so when uh, they, they're talking about the, the Mexican mafia, it's not the Latino mafia, not the Hispanic, it's not the Latinx mafia, it's the Mexican mafia. Again, these are the things that are meant to degrade us, have us shame, shame in who we are. So, uh, you know, knowing who you are, you need, to, you need to actually put some time into at least listening to some of the videos that tell you the history. Read the, the documented uh, history, not the, the cheating there or the, the racist stuff that's out there that says, oh, well, we, why would you want to know about those Aztecs? You know, it was all about human sacrifices. I don't want to learn about that. That's pretty much what they've done to us. Yeah. Not the fact that we had more and bigger cities than the Europeans, that our civilizations are older than anything that the Europeans have, that we did invent things that the Europeans never invented. Because the Europeans did not invent the wheel, they did not invent agriculture, they did not invent writing, they did not invent paper, they did not invent a whole bunch of things that are at the core of all civilizations. The, the Europeans are an offshoot of the Middle East. That's where they got all of those things. They did not invent the wheel in Europe, they did not invent writing, etc. So we also need to know the, the truth about the Europeans. Because they not only have lied about us, but they've lied about themselves, like calling themselves white. But we accept that they're white. They're not, they are not this color. Have you ever met any uh, European who has this color on them? See, this is kind of like reality check, right? They're pale. They're definitely pale, but they're not, but they're not white. Oh, yeah. So that's part of it. Is, and then the, other, the, the second part of the presentation has been about you know us preparing for, for Trump. And we had a little discussion before we started uh, videotaping this and uh, the importance of boycotts and protests. Protesting uh, in front of the Trump hotels, protesting anything Trump that, that we can do. But do it in an organized way. And the more of us that are doing it, the better, more effective. Once Trump starts losing millions of dollars and, and you know, he's already gone bankrupt uh, like six, seven times already. Let's see if we can make it one more time where he's totally bankrupt. Yeah. And then maybe he'll give up his hobby as president of the United States because it's obviously just a hobby for him to make more money. So, uh, unless there's any other question? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. We end this presentation with the third part of the trilogy. And yes... Consider this an endorsement. It is profound. And yes, very important that we endorse AGT. I have said this many times. Uh, it's AJ+. Plus. I mean, it's okay, but it's, but it's AJ+. Plus. And the name of this AJ+, Plus episode is Why People Become Neo-Nazis. Uh, this was published on March 5th, 2019. Portland, Oregon has a reputation. This is a city that's seen as very liberal. So liberal, the sketch comedy show Portlandia has pumped out eight seasons of material based solely on mocking its progressiveness. But there's another side to Portland, one that upends its perception as some sort of liberal paradise. In the 1990s, this area was known as Skinhead City, and it was a part of a region from where neo-Nazis used to recruit for their so-called Northwest imperative. You said you almost stabbed a black guy out here once. Why? Because he was hitting on my girlfriend at the time. And it pissed me off. And as I pulled my knife out, I was getting ready to stab him. And I looked up and there was a Portland PD about 10 feet away. The ubiquity of the internet and social media in the United States has only made the far-right recruitment process easier. Social media is big on the, the recruitment nowadays, especially uh, on YouTube. But what is it about the far-right violence movement 
that lures people into it. I liked people being afraid of me. You know, it's very seductive when you feel powerless to even the illusion of power. Right-wing extremism really is a direct challenge to liberal democracy. Hey fam, I'm Imayan, and for the third and final part of our series on far-right extreme violence, we've traveled to one of the most progressive cities in the nation, which also happens to be one of the whitest. And we're here to uncover why, even when Donald Trump leaves office, the problem of far-right violence won't end with his tenure, and how difficult it is to escape a life built on hate. There are nearly 650,000 residents in Portland, and more than 77% of them are white. That makes this place the whitest major city in the U.S., and perhaps the perfect breeding ground for people looking to enlist new white people in the far-right extremist movement. We come down here and look for uh, young kids, vulnerable kids, teenagers running around and that are white, obviously, and uh, try to introduce them to the neo-Nazi movement. A lot of times we give them like literature, uh, white power music. Jason Downard knows a lot about trying to woo white people to the extreme far right because he did it for years. And he says Oregon's history made his job of selling white supremacy much easier. How does such a liberal city have such an active white supremacist movement? It's a good question. It's formed, but Oregon, I think the biggest thing is Oregon was founded a white state, and back then blacks were uh, banned from Oregon. He's right. Oregon was established as a white racist utopia. A former slave owner helped pass a law in 1844 expelling black people from the territory. This is 15 years before Oregon gained statehood. And when it finally does become a state, it puts that exclusion of black and non-white people into its constitution. And this made Oregon an incredibly fertile place for the Ku Klux Klan. In the 1920s, it had the largest Klan membership per capita among any state. So yes, Oregon has given all of its electoral votes to the last eight Democratic presidential candidates. But it is also a place with a long history of anti-blackness, which neo-Nazis have used as part of their recruitment process. So we're down here on the Portland waterfront and you used to recruit people for the neo-Nazi movement here. How did you do that? We come down here and look for uh, young kids, vulnerable kids, or uh, we recruit them and see if it's even worth a shot. Downard is a former neo-Nazi who first got involved with the movement during his 2009 prison sentence for a drive-by shooting involving the unlawful use of firearms. His body became a place to enshrine extremism, a way to literally display his hatred. Do you have any tattoos from your former life? No, they're all covered up, but you know, you can still see the WP for the white power underneath. Oh my God. You can see, yeah. And then these little black lines right here, this is the 1488. The 1488. Of all the things Downard and I discussed, what resonated with me most was just how covert far-right extremist tactics are. And it's by design. There was a, a conscious uh, shift away from sort of this like street thug life, gang like culture. Dress nicer, get your education, and then infiltrate jobs like law enforcement, military, government policy, um, places where you could begin to enact some real change. Former neo-Nazi Shannon Foley Martinez says she wasn't recruited into violent, hate-fueled life by members who'd infiltrated her community. Instead, it was her insecurity as a self-proclaimed out-of-place teenager in search of an identity that started her on the path to extremism. Interestingly, like I started off uh, with like hippie 
60s uh, anti-Vietnam uh, culture. Um, one of my very first favorite books was actually the autobiography of Malcolm X. Martinez says she was a person already susceptible to influence. And then a horrendous violation pushed her toward a life of hate. And I ended up being raped by two men at that party. Um, they were white men. Within about six months of uh, being sexually assaulted, I started hanging out with skinheads who were always on the periphery of the, the punk culture that I was a part of. Between the ages of 15 and 20, Martinez was a neo-Nazi and hoped it'd be a place she'd finally be able to belong. She thought being with the neo-Nazis could allow her to release the anger about her sexual assault. You know, my self-image and my self-worth just plummeted that, uh, you know, in the, in the wake of, of that rape, that I just felt like a piece of trash. I felt worthless on a, on a really deep and inherent level. And, you know, there's that part of me that was like, okay, well, like, who's worse than the Nazis? Like, they've got to take me in, right? Like, it doesn't matter that I'm, that I'm worthless. The community Martinez searched for and talks about is also a theme down at Echoed. It's the sales pitch the hate group makes to potential members. It's all about this warped sense of unity. For Downard, the support was a group to belong to in a radically racialized prison system. His story is a tale of recidivism and getting deeply involved with the neo-Nazi movement with each subsequent conviction. Have there been violent crimes of which you haven't been associated with or convicted with when you were part of the movement? That's a tricky question. No, no, it's not a trick question. Wait, have I committed? Yeah. I don't talk about those things. I mean, I've I've done I've done horrible things that like I got to live with every day. You know, almost stabbed some people and might have stabbed some. I, I won't go into those details. You know what I mean? Just because it's it's a hard thing to live with. Downard's and Martinez's neo-Nazi paths are one type of far-right extremism, which generally falls into two categories political and anti-government, like the alleged MAGA bomber Caesar Sayoc, a Republican and huge Trump supporter, accused of targeting the president's political enemies with mail bombs. And then there are those on the far right who are hate-based, like the neo-Nazis with whom Downard and Martinez were once affiliated. And though Downard says President Trump's rhetoric has played a role in reinvigorating far right groups, Donald Trump's presidency has been a victory for the movement. He's saying all the right stuff. So you get these neo-Nazis like, hey, we got this president. It's pretty much giving us the okay to do whatever the hell we want. Author David Nywood says even when Donald Trump leaves the Oval Office, this type of violent extremism will still be a problem. This problem didn't start with Donald Trump. When he leaves office, we're going to have another generation before we can really uh, sort of corral these forces of hatred that he's unleashed. What's happened is that a whole new generation of young people have been radicalized into this belief system. Nagward says President Trump's favorite cable news channel contributes to gassing up far-right extremism. We believe in free speech, even when it's reprehensible, maybe especially when it is. You'll see Tucker Carlson talking about white nationalism on or espousing white nationalist views on national TV, on Fox, and getting away with it. And people just kind of going, shrugging their shoulders. Nywood has followed the far right for 30 years, first as a journalist and later as an author. He says there's a reason far right extremism movements are often unsuccessful. Typically, right wing extremists never get enough momentum going because they've never uh, been able to stay cohesive for very long because of their very nature. So the, a lot of the people drawn to right-wing extremists are really kind of contentious and unpleasant people. They hardly ever get along. They're constantly fighting. What do neo-Nazis think of Klansmen and people like that? The neo-Nazis don't like the Klansmen. Uh, Why not? They're a bunch of drunk killbillies, like to me, and they're all, they're just weird. Like, I don't know. I've never liked him from the get-go. 
The birth of Downard's biracial nephew is one thing that helped spur him to reject his neo-Nazi beliefs. The other was a recovery facility he entered after another jail stint. So these are the doors you went into that changed your life? I was facing another year in jail. I was already in jail and was facing up to a year, and so it's kind of my getaway. I had the chance to go to treatment. But leaving a life you've recruited people into is dangerous. It's, it's really hard um, because you're dealing with a uh, violent organization that's not only in your city, but it's, it's a worldwide, nationwide. They consider us race traitors and stuff like that, so. Do you worry about that? I did for a little bit, but I learned to get over it because I feel like what I'm doing is not only bringing peace to myself, but if I can tell my story, it can help somebody else that's maybe struggling like I was for a few years if I want to leave the movement or not. Downard now spends his time helping others escape a life of hate that consumed him until two years ago. He's hoping his transition from a self-proclaimed hooligan to patience, like his tattoo, will inspire others. I know there's people that's in the movement that wants to get out of the movement, but it's a very violent thing to get out, and some of them, they don't know how to. What I'm doing is not only bringing peace to myself, but if I can tell my story, it can help somebody else that's maybe struggling like I was for a few years. Like Downard, Martinez has dedicated her life to helping others escape the neo-Nazi lifestyle. And her approach is informed by how she felt when she left the movement. I, mean, I was very, very lonely. Um, you know, because who do you go to? Who do you say, you know, I'm really struggling because I was a Nazi. Like, how do you, how, who do you say that to? I remember exactly what I felt like during that time, how alone I felt, how confused I felt, how filled with shame that I felt. The mother of seven says even though she's been out of the movement more than a decade, the work she does on herself is never ending. A lot of people are gonna see this video and wonder, can you ever really be a former white supremacist? Can you ever really be a former neo-Nazi? Until I started uh, sharing my story very publicly, uh, I, I had no idea that so many people believed that fundamental transformation is not possible. Now, I can categorically say I do not believe that ideology at all. I see how flawed and broken and just how harmful um, and have built a life on really trying to you know, make meaningful amends, um, do everything that I can, lending my voice to build a genuinely just and equitable uh, society for us to, to live in, that my transformation has indeed been an absolute one. In the process of creating this series, I talked to people around the nation. One thing I heard from a couple of interviewees was a call for empathy for those participating in far-right hate. They say we shouldn't shut them out because it could push them further into a life of hate. Everyone is more than the worst thing that they've ever done. My question is, and was, what about their victims, like the people of color and bystanders that their hate targets? Why should they bear the burden of empathy or forgiveness? I absolutely understand that calls for any sort of empathetic listening or compassion towards white supremacists does not sit well with segments of the population. And I totally understand that. As a white person, it is my responsibility to dismantle white supremacy. As a person of color, it is not your responsibility to dismantle white supremacy. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is the third and final part of our series. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, please look them up. They're linked in the description, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.